الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله تعالى we hope to finish this 50 line poem uh, in the next two days today and also tomorrow إن شاء الله تعالى there is a lot of information that needs to be written down which inshallah ta'ala after that is memorized by every single one of you and then taught to our siblings, our relatives, the people in our communities and you will see that inshallah ta'ala the ilm sticks when you do so. I think it's worth pointing out before we actually start the manduma that we study these different texts and poems in the different madahib in order to understand the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sayings and actions. This is the objective. The objective is not to become a madhabist, a blind follower of any kind, but rather to understand what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and that which he carried out with his limbs. This is the objective. Our Shaykh Salih ibn Abdullah ibn Hamd al Husaymi has got a line of poetry where he says, وَتَجْعَلِ الْمُتُونَ لِلتَّفْقِيهِ وَسِيلَةً لِرُتْبَةِ الْفَقِيهِ These mutun, these texts, these poems, it is just a wasila. It's just a means to reach your objective which is to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam both mentioned. And this is exactly what we are trying to inshallah ta'ala accomplish. They are no different to the different examples. I'm sure you guys have heard of OCR, AQA, Adexo, where you sit an exam for the same subject as everybody else, except that the exam board is different. Does that make sense? So whether it is the Hanbali Madhab or the Shafi'i Madhab or the Hanafi Madhab or any other Madhab, the Maliki Madhab, it is just there as a curriculum for you to understand what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with. Because if we don't go through this madahib, and I'm not saying that it's a must that you have to take this particular route, it could become extremely overwhelming. Maybe on one particular topic you will find so many hadith. And as a beginning student of fiqh, it will just be so overwhelming to comprehend. So this is why we have these different madahib that makes life so much more easier. As a beginning student of knowledge, you just want to learn how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last time I came here, I went through Al-Nazm al azgar the short, concise poem on fiqh. Did anybody watch that? طيب. Anyone else? Out of all the brothers who came, I think we have one person. Okay, it's a 32-line poem. Okay, similar to this, except that this time round it's a 50 line poem where we take more messiah. We take more issues. So we are going by tajarruj, which basically means taking it step by step. We take something that is pretty simple and then we build on it. And then inshallah ta'ala after this poem, we hope to go through a thousand line poem called Al-Nazmul Jali Fil Fiqh al hanbali but let's just, inshallah ta'ala, finish this verse and understand it. When you guys do get a chance, listen to that poem. It's on the Medina College uh, YouTube channel, right? It was very, very simplified, very simplified. And inshallah ta'ala, this time around, it will also be very simple, but we will add on what we previously took, right? So we go by Tadaruj. <coughs> do we have a reader? Where's that? He's not here, eh? Yeah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بحمد ربي الذي إن يريد بعبده خيرا يفقه أبتدي ثم صلاة الله مع سلامي على النبي معلم الأحكام وبعد فالفقه على قسمين 
فرد كفاية وفرد عين فهاك في ثنيهما منظومة وجيزة واضحة مفهومة الشيخ من الله سبحانه وتعالى preserve him and have mercy upon him the fact that I'm saying may Allah have mercy upon him does that mean he's dead هذا من أخطاء العامة I remember our teacher in the Ma'had when studying in the University of Al Medina, he said this is from the very common mistakes of the general folk. They think you only say, May Allah have mercy upon him if he has passed away. If I make dua for you, May Allah Azza wa Jalla have mercy upon you, does that mean that you're dead? Or you're not in need of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So our Shaykh Amir Bahjat is still a living human being who teaches in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's masjid. At a very young age, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him by giving him a position in one of the most honorable masajid on the face of this earth. If you Google him, you will see that he's extremely young. Is it surprising to me? No, it's not. One characteristic that the shaykh is known for is a tawadu, being humble to the creation. While you sit with him, you will feel that you are no different to him. You will feel that you are no different to him. And this is a trait that you will struggle to find in many. As the Messenger Sallallahu said, وَمَا تَوَاضَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّهِ إِلَّا رَفَعَهُ Never does an individual humble himself except that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will raise him. And you can also see from his works how much service he has done to Al-Fiqh. Another thing that he is extremely uh, good at is simplifying knowledge. And that reminds me of a Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin rahmatullahi alayhi. Today, a seeker of knowledge in whatever science he's starting with, right? When he finds the explanation of Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin rahmatullahi alayhi, you will see him hovering towards it. And that is because of its simplicity. And that is because of how easy the Shaykh broke down knowledge. And also, a Shaykh Amir Bahjat, hafizahullah ta'ala, our beloved teacher, he's known for that. So let's get straight into it, inshallah ta'ala. The first four lines of poetry, brothers and sisters, are a little bit technical. So bear with me, inshallah ta'ala. He says, بِحَمْدِ رَبِّيَ الَّذِي إِنْ يُرِدِي بِعَبْدِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهْ أَبْتَدِي He starts off by doing hamd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who, if he wants, Goodness for his servant, he grants him al-fiqh. He grants him al-fiqh. So he says, Abtadi, I start with doing hamd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my Lord. That if he wants good for his servant, he grants him al-fiqh. And I will stand over each time, insha'Allah ta'ala. What does al-hamd mean? When you open up the translation of the Quran, you find alhamdulillah. رب العالمين ما معنى الحمد All praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Lord of the worlds The reality of the matter brothers and sisters does this translation really give what alhamd mean it's true justice Take this as a principle from me brothers and sisters The English language does not give the Arabic language its true justice what does Alhamd mean? Alhamd, brothers and sisters, and I'm going to give you guys a whole sentence just to explain what Alhamd means. It means, وَصْفُ الْمَحْمُودِ بِالْكَمَالِ مَعَ مَحَبَّةٍ وَتَعْظِيمٍ A whole sentence just to explain what Alhamd means in Arabic language, which means to attribute completeness to the one who's deserving of all praise coupled with love and glorification. Allahu Akbar. Right? And may Allah Azza wa Jal reward the translators of the Qur'an. They are trying their utmost best to give a summarized, short translation of the noble Qur'an. So it wouldn't even make sense for them to go into a lot of detail when doing so. However, when we go through these mutun, it's important that we give each kalima, each word, its true justice. So I'll just say that again. To attribute completeness. To the one who is deserving of all praise. To the one who is deserving of all praise. Coupled with love and glorification. Coupled with love and glorification. 
So it means more than just praising. I may praise you simply because I have an ultra motive. I know you're a rich individual. And by me praising you and mentioning you in a positive light, it could be that it comes with a lot of perks. In previous times, brothers and sisters, there would be poetry competitions held by kings. So the skillful poets would come from around the country to partake in this competition. The one with the greatest poetry, he would walk away with the prize money. So they would come out with their poems, praising the king, and he's sitting there listening to that which is being read out. Now let me ask you, these poets who walk into this palace, do they have an intention other than walking away with the prize money? Is it really done with love and glorification when they are praising the king? The answer is no. Probably by the time he reaches the outside of them four walls, right? He starts ridiculing the king. Gave me all of this money and I don't even mean it. I put together all of these lines of poetry and the reality of the matter is I just wanted the prize money. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? So praise, praise is very different to what alhamd. It has to be coupled with love and also glorification. So when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not like praising another human being or anyone else from the creation. We mean it from our hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored us with so many different blessings that cannot be enumerated. And if you were to count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you wouldn't. At times it is highly recommended, brothers and sisters, that one sits with himself and he reflects on all of that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored him with. And then see the kind of praise you end up uttering, which is very different to when we praise the creation. So he says, praise to my Lord, the one, if he wants goodness for his servant, he grants him what? Al-fiqh. This, this wording that the Shaykh has used is very similar to a hadith. Who can tell me the hadith? Good. Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for, he gives him al-fiqh in the religion. The hadith is on the authority of the great companion, Katib al-Wahi, the one who used to write down the revelation as instructed by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muawiyah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. In this hadith, my brothers and my sisters, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for his servant, he grants him fiqh. I will explain inshaAllah wa ta'ala what al fiqh means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala handpicked you out of all of his creation to sit down in a class just so you can uplift ignorance from yourself. And this, my brothers and my sisters, you should take it personally. Because on this day, you could have been doing so many different things. Wallahi, for the last 48 hours, I wasn't at ease simply because I came to know about a wedding that is taking place on a boat. And on this boat, they are going to be blasting music and perhaps other sorts of sins are going to be taking place. And it's happening today. A lot of you could have been engaging in that which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he picked you and chose you brothers and sisters to be sitting in this classroom to build an understanding of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you should really take that personally brothers and sisters. Right? So if Allah azza wa jal wants good for you, he gives you that fiqh in the religion. Shaykh al-Islam Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi he comments when speaking about the mafhum that which you can understand from this hadith. 
Because brothers and sisters, when we look at the hadith, it has a direct meaning. And you can also take the mafhum which is that which you understand from it. So the direct literal meaning of a hadith and also the mafhum that which you can understand from it. He says, كل من أراد الله به خيرا لا بد أن يفقه في الدين Every individual that Allah wanted good for, he must give him fiqh in the religion. ومن لم يفقه في الدين لم يرد الله به خيرا And if Allah Azza wa does not grant you al-fiqh, he did not want good for you. He, Allah Azza wa Jal, did not want good for you. So be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he chose you to be amongst from those who are here hoping to acquire an understanding of his religion. And then brothers and sisters, you have al-fiqh. What does al-fiqh mean? You have the literal meaning of al-fiqh and you also have the technical meaning of al-fiqh. Al-fiqh in the language, brothers and sisters, it means to understand. More specifically, it means to understand inherently. To understand something. What did the people of Shu'ayb say to him? قالوا يا شعيب ما نفقه كثيرا مما تقول. Oh Shu'ayb, we do not have fiqh of what you are saying. What were they trying to say? If we take the literal meaning that I just mentioned, which is to understand, or more specifically to understand inherently. They are saying to him, we don't have fiqh, O Shu'ayb, of what you are saying. Meaning? Exactly. We don't understand what you're saying, O Shu'ayb. Also, Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, what did he say in Surah Taha? Qala rabbi shrahli sadri. O Allah, grant me peace. وَيَسْتِرْ لِي أَمْرِي And make it easy for me in my affair. وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي Untie these knots on my tongue. يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي So that they have fiqh of what I'm saying. What does that mean? So they understand the tahara and the salah that I'm about to teach them. When Musa was going to Fir'aun, is that what he's saying? لا, so they can understand that which I am saying to them. So it has a literal meaning which means to understand. Does that make sense brothers and sisters? In a more narrow sense it can arguably mean to understand the objective of the speaker. So all of these brothers and sisters they what? And they overlap with one another. At the end of the day the literal meaning of al-fiqh is to understand. It is to understand. طيب, then you have the technical meaning of al-fiqh. The scholars, they mention a general meaning and also a more specific technical meaning of al-fiqh. Let me ask you all a question. Would you say that aqidah falls under the meaning of al-fiqh? Or should I make it more clear? Does it fall under the general meaning of al-fiqh? Jameel. Shaykh al-Islam Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi when he explained what al-fiqh is he said فَهْمُ مَعَانِ الْأَمْرِ وَالنَّهِ لِيَسْتَبْصِرَ الْإِنسَانُ فِي دِينِهِ Understanding the commandments and prohibitions so that one is able to have insight in the religion. I'll say that again. فَهْمُ مَعَانِ الْأَمْرِ وَالنَّهِ لِيَسْتَبْصِرَ الْإِنسَانُ فِي دِينِهِ Understanding the commandments and also the prohibitions so that one is able to have insight in his religion. Now let me ask you, does عقيدة fall under it? Without a shadow of a doubt, right? There are commandments and prohibitions that are not fiqh related. that are not tahara, salah, Fasting, Umrah, Hajj, transacting, they are not related to that which you would normally study in the chapters of fiqh. So when you are now commanded and instructed, for example now, you have been instructed to be distant from a zina. Would this normally go under 
issues pertaining to al-fiqh. It covers the ahkam of someone who committed a zina, right? However, you are now being instructed to stay away from what? A zina. This is what? A prohibition. Stay away from zina. Does that make sense? So, to just summarize, the general meaning of al-fiqh is the awamir and the nawahi. The commandments and also the prohibitions in the legislation. لِيَسْتَبْصِرَ الْإِنسَانُ فِي دِينِهِ Then you have that which is more specific brothers and sisters and this is what we are here to study. And this is what we are here to study. And al-fiqh my brothers and my sisters it is to have knowledge of the rulings ahkam of the sharia pertaining to the physical actions. To have knowledge of the rulings al-ahkam al pertaining to the physical actions. Al-tahara now Al-Salah, are these physical actions that one needs to carry out? Jameel. Ahkam, Sharia rulings pertaining to that which one needs to carry out when worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in a nutshell, you have the general meaning of al-fiqh when you look at the technical side of things. And then you also have that which is specific, which is what we're going to be inshaAllah ta'ala covering. It's a lot of information, right? For just the first line of poetry. Did you guys manage to understand that? Or was that too technical? I think it's pretty straightforward, right? Huh, Ahmed? Ahmed, mashallah, is one of the devout attendees. When I go through inheritance, if I ask him a couple of questions on inheritance, he'll... Huh? Tayyip. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us fiqh in the religion. Ameen. Then he says... ثم صلاة الله مع سلامي على النبي معلم الأحكام. Spare with me إن شاء الله تعالى with these technicalities. It is a must that we go through it. And then the practical side of things إن شاء الله تعالى. It is from line number five. And that which comes after it. ثم صلاة الله مع سلامي على النبي معلم الأحكام. And then he says the صلاة of الله سبحانه وتعالى and also the salam upon who the Prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who is muallim muallim means the teacher of al-ahkam the teacher of the sharia rulings right is the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sent down verses in the Quran and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then explained these verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down as Allah mentions wa anzalna ilayka al-dhikra litubayyina lin-nas ma نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ And indeed we send down the Qur'an upon you so that you may what? Explain and clarify to the people. You would not be able to perform hajj and to also pray properly if it wasn't for what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained to us in his prophetic sunnah. Agreed? This is now a rebuttal on the Qur'an yun. Those who say that the Qur'an is sufficient, we don't need anything else. لا. Does it say in the Qur'an exactly how much you need to pay when you have 10,000 pounds in the bank? doesn't have that. Does it give you the intricates of hajj? No, it doesn't. Does it give you the intricates of how to perform the salah? No, it doesn't. They are two things that go hand in hand with one another. The Qur'an and the sunnah. And even the Qur'an commands you to follow the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is what? Mu'allim al He's the one who teaches the Sharia rulings that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent down upon him. So that's the latter part of the second line of poetry. Let's inshaAllah Ta'ala stand over. ثُمَّ صَلَاةُ اللَّهِ مَعَ سَلَامِ When we say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have we ever thought about what that actually means? Depending on who the salah is attributed back to, the meaning would differ. So when now, you as a human being is sending your salah upon the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is very different to when Allah Azza wa Jal sends his salah upon 
his messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and likewise when the angels do it. Because what did Allah Azza wa Jalla say? Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Allah and the angels they send their salah upon the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then you believer is instructed ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Oh you who believe sallu alayhi send your salah upon him and also send your salams. Does that make sense, my beloved brothers and sisters? So what does it actually mean when you send your salah upon the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And again, brothers and sisters, whenever we study terms, it has a linguistic and it also has a technical meaning, right? If we just look at the general linguistic meaning of a salah, it means a dua. The linguistic meaning of a salah, it means a dua. Give you guys an example from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Man du'iya ila walimatin fal yujib. If you are invited to a walima, everyone knows what walima is, right? Somebody gets married, they have a sheep party. Everybody knows what the sheep party is or the lamb party. But they invite you over to have what? Meat. Or maybe in some cultures they have chicken. Huh? Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Awlim walaw bishatin. Have you a walima even if it is with one sheep? So it's better to have sheep and chicken. طيب. If you are invited to a walima, then accept the invitation. Then look what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi said. فَإِنْ كَانُوا صَائِمًا فَلْيُصَلِّي عَلَيْهِ However, if you are fasting, then do your salah upon that individual. Does that mean you start praying the salah to janazah in the walima? If you are fasting, then go and do your salah. What kind of salah here? Huh, brothers? Make dua for him. What's the dua that you make for him? Barakallahu lak wa barak alayk wa jama'a baynakum wa fi khair. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless that which is between him and his spouse. You ask him to bless this individual's marriage. For those who don't know, our brother Ahmed recently got married. So inshallah, when you do see him, make sure you send your salah upon him. Huh? Jameel. That's what it means linguistically. Does that make sense? Taib. And the technical meaning of a salah is that which you all know. That which you all know. Right? Aqwalun wa af'alun makhsusa Specific physical actions and statements. Muftatahatun bit takbiri wa muhtatamatun bit taslimi. That starts with the takbir, Allahu Akbar, and that ends with as-salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. The opposite, right? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense, inshallah. So the linguistic meaning is what? That which we already mentioned, a dua. And then the technical meaning is the salah that everybody is pretty well acquainted with. Tayyib. So now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his salah, Upon the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's stand over each one. Allah, the angel, and also the human being. What would it actually mean? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sending a salah upon the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It means, Thana'ullahi ala abdi fil mala'il ala. Kama qala abul aliyah. It means Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala praising and making good mention of his Prophet in the congregation of the angels. So we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that upon his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as for the angels, it is them asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Adamiyin, the children of Adam, it is them making dua for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Taib, now we understand what as salah upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam means. What about the salam? What does the salam mean? Ah. Taib, only that? Jameel, excellent. هذا هو. 
When we send our salam upon the Prophet ﷺ, in his lifetime, we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve his body. And after he has passed away, to preserve the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sharia. Right? Someone may ask, Tayyib, after he has passed away, does he really need protection? He himself may not necessarily need physical protection, but his sunnah without a shadow of a doubt needs it. Alayhi Isn't that so? From the moment he died all the way up until this very day, brothers and sisters, the enemies of Islam, they are always looking for different ways in tarnishing the image of our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They try their utmost best to make him look like a barbaric, bloodthirsty human being. They keep trying, they keep trying. In 2015, after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, right? Many politicians, they came together to sign a declaration. You know what this declaration was? The right of freedom of speech and the right to offend. This was after they depicted cartoons of our Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The right to offend. And at the time, brothers and sisters, this was extremely offensive to 1.5 billion Muslims. That was then. And now it is what? 1.8 billion and counting. And it could be possibly even more than that. He doesn't have a Facebook account. Doesn't have a Twitter account. Or a Snapchat. Or whatever other social media platform. And still the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has more followers than every influential individual that's walking on the face of this earth today. They want to extinguish the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but Allah refuses except to make the light shine. And there will always be in every time and age individuals who equip themselves with knowledge that will defend the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? And if you want to be from those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, right? وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَك, right? Indeed, we raised your mention. Ibn al-Qayyim or Ibn Taymi, I believe, one of them mentioned that if you want to be from those whose name is raised in this world, then be somebody who learns the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, acts upon it and then calls to it. And without a shadow of a doubt, defending the honor of your Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will have a share of that. طيب. And then he says, فَهَاكَ فِي ثَانِيهِمَا لَا وَبَعْدُ فَالْفِقْهُ عَلَى قِسْمَيْنِ فَرْدُ كِفَايَةٍ وَفَرْدُ عَيْنِ He then says that fiqh is of two types, or is split into two. You have a type of fiqh, my beloved brothers and sisters, that is what? An individual obligation, fardu ayn. And the definition that the usuliyun, the scholars of usul fiqh mention is, huwa ma talabahu shari'u fi'lahu talaban jaziman min kulli mukallafin bi'aynih. Is that which the legislator has requested from the one who is religiously obliged in an imposing way. Requesting from every person who is religiously obliged. Like, who can give me an individual obligation? Salah? Anything else? Zakat? Ayah? Providing, of course, that the conditions are met. Also, psalm, fasting. There are acts of worship, my brothers and my sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants every individual who is religiously obliged to carry out. Every person, what? Has to carry out. You can't just say, so-and-so prayed, and because of that, I'm cool. He uplifted that obligation from me. That's the second type, which is referred to as a communal obligation. فَرْدُ كِفَايَةً وَهُوَ مَا طَلَبُوا الشَّارِعُ فِعْلَهُ طَلَبًا جَازِمًا مِنْ غَيْرِ تَعْيِينِ فَاعِلِهِ As the Usuliyun mentioned. 
is that which the legislator has requested from those who are religiously obliged without specifying who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it done from or wants it done by. For example now, if somebody now, what's this road called? Brixton Road? Am I guessing yeah? Brixton Road, huh? Taib. We have a brother who drops dead. Drops dead. And everyone just turns around and says, you know what? I'm busy, so mind our own business. As the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, part of one being a good Muslim is that he only busies himself with that which concerns him. Or he stays away from that which huh, is of no concern to him. So you know what? I'm going to mind my own business and I'm going to go home. Let others deal with him. Every person who walks past has that same mentality. You know what? Someone else will come. It's none of my business. That is family. His family could be in Somalia. Huh? Let them come and pick him up from the road in front of the station. What will happen, my brothers and my sisters here? والثاني فرضه عليهم والأداء يكفي إذا من بعضهم قد وجد right إذا قام به البعض سقط عن الآخرين if some people fulfill this obligation the obligation is lifted from everyone else however if nobody does it everybody will sin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just wants it done and Allah azza wa jal doesn't care who does it. He just wants it done. Does that make sense? So dealing with this deceased individual, getting him washed, praying the janazah on him, and then burying him is a communal obligation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants done without specifying who he wants it done by. As opposed to that which is an individual obligation does that make sense brothers and sisters again I know I'm going through quite a few technicalities but it must be covered they are, they are the first four lines of this poem does that make sense so the poet he gives some examples enjoining the good and forbidding the evil is that a communal obligation or is that an individual obligation? Farduain? Taib, anyone else? Farduain. Taib, doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Waltakun minkum. Let there be from amongst you. Ba'id wa bayin wa abtadif il amkina. Right? As Ibn Malik rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned in the thousand line poem of Arabic grammar. From the meanings of min is that some. Let there rise up from amongst you a group who enjoin the good and forbid the people and call the people to goodness. Taib, doesn't that show that there is what? That this is a communal obligation? If now somebody is sinning, does every person have to go up to that individual? Listen, you shouldn't be doing this. Does every person have to go up to him? He might just have enough of all the haram police. Huh? Every one of them is coming up to me and saying to me that what I'm doing is wrong. Huh? So is it a communal obligation or is it an individual obligation? It is a communal obligation. That if some people carry out this obligation, it is uplifted from everyone else. If everybody says, you know what? Can't be bothered. Let me mind my own business. And people say this, right? You try to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. You tell him that what you're doing is wrong. What, what's the response that you get? Achim, mind your own business. Especially in sittings where they're backbiting another individual. Mind your own business, you are told, the moment you speak out. This is what? Using that hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khuddi radiallahu ta'ala anhu in other than its proper context. Yes, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa did say, part of one being a good Muslim is to leave of that which doesn't concern him. And then they even use the hadith to you. No, it's become my business. Because you are sinning in front of me. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told me, Man ra minkum munkaran, fal yughayyiru biyadi. Whoever sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. 
You can't change it with your hand, you change it with your tongue. You can't change it with your tongue, you change it with your heart. How do you change it with your heart? You get up and you leave. So it is part of my business now. Right? That which doesn't concern you is to speak about people's private lives between Muhammad and his wife Khadija. Oh, guess what he done? They should have done this and they should have done that. That's not your business. That which doesn't concern you is things like that. But you are now sitting in front of me. It is an obligation upon me uh, to do something about it. Does that make sense? So, Al-Amru bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar is a communal obligation. And then he says, فَهَاكَ فِي ثَانِيهِمَا مَنْظُومَةً وَجِيزَةً وَاضِحَةً مَفْهُومَةً فَهَاكَ This is what is Ishara. Here you have the second poem. What's the first poem? Huh? Nadm al-Saghir or Nadm al-Asghar? Nadm al-Asghar. Nadm al-Saghir is another poem that the Sheikh authored in Usul Fiqh. MashaAllah Jameel. Another one asked that we taught. Did anyone here attend that in Medina College? It was on a weekday, it was on a Monday. No one, huh? SubhanAllah. Maybe in the other room. So everyone here is new. And Jameel, so this is now what? The second poem. So the second level, we can maybe call it. He says, Wajizatan. It is concise, wadihatan, very clear, mafhuma, easy to understand. Does that make sense, my beloved brothers and sisters? Tayyib. Now we get into the juicy part of things. He says, Bab al-Tahara. The chapter of al-Tahara. What does al-Tahara mean? Again, we have the linguistic definition of al-Tahara and also the technical one. Al-Nazahatu wal-Nadhafatu an al-Aqdar. Cleanliness from impurities. That's what it means in the language. Cleanliness from impurities. And then you have the technical meaning of al-tahara. Irtifa'u al-hadathi wa ma ma'nah wa zawalu al-khabath. Pay attention, brother and sister. This is now very, very important. It is to remove the spiritual impurities and also the visible physical impurities. I'll say that again. At-Tahara, in a nutshell, brothers and sisters, it can get more technical, but I will refrain from going into too many technicalities with regards to this term. What we need to know here is, irtifa'u al-hadath wa ma fi ma'nah. To remove the spiritual impurities, that's the first part of the definition. And the second part is, wazawalu al-khabath, to remove the visible physical impurities. Let's turn over the first part of it. To remove the spiritual impurities, this is of two types. Minor spiritual impurities and also what? Major spiritual impurities. Let me ask you guys a question, right? Someone has just passed air. Someone has just passed air. Happens? Of course it does. Are there any visible physical impurities? Can we say that from the time that he passed air, all the way up until he makes wudu. The way we can describe his state is that he has a spiritual impurity. Which one is that? Minor or major? Minor. We say this individual now has hadathun asghar. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? One has gone into the bathroom to relieve himself. After removing the visible physical impurities, his urine or his feces. From that point on, all the way up until he makes wudu, are there any visible physical impurities? How would we describe the state of this individual? That he has huh, spiritual impurity. Which one, the minor or the major? Minor, Jameel. Taib, one had sexual intercourse. He went into the bathroom, cleaned himself. All the way up until he takes the ghusl bath, the purificatory bath, if you want the English term. 
How would we describe this individual or the state that he's in? Huh? Yahya. Major spiritual impurity. Physical or spiritual? I heard somebody say physical. Spiritual impurity. Does everybody get that? Tayyip. And then you have the visible physical impurities. Like somebody now just done the number two. These feces that have come out of his body are considered visible physical impurities. And also other fluids and types of discharge that comes out of one's private part. It varies between it being najis, impure, and also what? Tahir. Right? Who can give me a type of impurity? Sorry, let me just rephrase that. A type of discharge that comes out of one's front private part that is not impure, that is not najis. Huh, tfadl. Many or many? Many, good. The sperm that comes out of a man and also woman's from private part. Is that tahir or is it najis? That's tahir according to the Hanabila and the Shafi'iyya. According to the Hanbalis and also the Shafi'is, this is considered what? A pure substance and not an impure one. So it come, if it comes in contact with your clothes, you can still pray in them. Right? You can still pray in it. You as a human being, you've been created from what? خُلِقَ مِنْ مَاءٍ دافق. You are created from sperm. So if we say now that sperm is impure, does that mean that you are created from an impure substance? And also Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she would use, right, some oud to remove it. And even though she was removing it, if I asked you now, feces came in contact with your clothes and then you used like a siwak to remove it. It still leaves bits and bobs of the feces, right? Would you be able to pray for that? You would have to make sure that you remove it completely. صح? And the fact that she was just using this root to remove it and then the Messenger of Allah would go and pray in it, it shows that it's a pure substance. And there's another narration that he washed it off and the fact that he washed it off, does that mean it's always impure? If someone now pours Lucasade on your clothes, like yesterday we had a brother of, you know, no, no, it's not, yeah. You poured Lucasade on your clothes. It is dirty, but is it actually impure? No. Does that make sense? Type. Don't worry too much about that. So now we know exactly what Tahara is. Tahara, brothers and sisters, for lack of a better term, I call it the umbrella chapter. Where there's so many sub chapterings that fall under at tahara like al wudu the chapter of utensils that which relates to the purificatory bath tayammum how to clean yourself likewise what that which relates to menses so there are so many different sub chapterings that fall under this umbrella chapter which is what at tahara that's why then he says wa fasrun fasal fusul is what you would normally find in the books of fiqh. It says fasl, meaning like a subchaptering. Fil wudu. The first chapter that comes under at tahara that we're going to be inshallah ta'ala covering in this manduma is al wudu. Right? Fihi shurutu thumma ma yuftaradu. The wudu, my brothers and my sisters, it means who is the amalu ma in tahurin. It is to use a type of water that is tahur, which inshallah ta'ala we will stand over. On four body parts in a specific way. He then says, He says, The wudu has conditions. And also that which is fard. Who can give me the difference between conditions and also fard? Tayyib, <laughs> anyone else want to add anything to that? 
conditions is before and also during. طيب. Huh? جميل. Conditions, my brothers and my sisters, are prerequisites. That which must come before the act of worship. Prerequisites, that which must come before the act of worship. Even the poet, he says, وَالْفَرْضُ فِي عِبَادَةٍ قَدْ وَلَجَا وَالشَّرْتُ فِي عِبَادَةٍ قَدْ خَرَجَا The condition is that which is outside of the act of worship. A prerequisite, that which needs to be met before you go forth in doing that act of worship. Okay? For example, now the salah has conditions. Who can quickly give me a condition that must be met before you start the salah? But face the qibla. Also, you have to make wudu. Your salah, which is the act of worship, right? And the wudu is the condition. You must come on the condition before you do the act of worship. So you can clearly say it's outside of the salah itself. Taib the usuliyun, they mention as a definition, again, I'm going to get a little bit technical here because I have to, right? A sharp, technically speaking, it means, right? مَا يَلْزَمُ مِنْ عَدَمِهِ الْعَدَمِ وَلَا يَلْزَمُ مِنْ وُجُودِهِ الْوُجُودِ You not coming with the condition, it necessitates that you also didn't come with that which you did the condition for. Does that make sense? <laughs> you not coming with the condition, it necessitates that you also didn't come with that which you did the condition for. Or that which you would do the condition for. That makes sense. I didn't come with the condition of wudu. That also means I didn't come with that which you would do the condition for, which is the salah. Does that make sense? You not coming with the condition of an act of worship by default, makes that act of worship that you would do the condition for also at invalid, meaning that you didn't come with that properly as well. And the fact that you came with the condition, it doesn't necessitate that you came also with that which you do the condition for. For example, again, let's just use the example of the wudu and the salah. You came with the wudu. Does that mean you also came with that which you did the condition for, i.e. in this situation, the salah? Don't worry, brothers. I know I'm saying it very, very quickly, but it took me a very long time, right, to master saying that in English. It's probably maybe the 20th time I'm teaching it. Translating usul al-fiqh terms can be what? Extremely exhausting mentally. At times I would sit for an hour so looking at an usul al-fiqh principle, how can I translate this? And what examples can I use when teaching it in the United Kingdom? Does that make sense? So we just have to go through some of these technicalities from time to time. And it takes a bit of time to sometimes, you know, get your head around. There are conditions and there are also what? That which is fard. Fard is in the act of worship. We can maybe even call it a pillar. We could even maybe call it a pillar. The wudu has pillars. Right? They have that which is in common with one another and they also have that which is different from one another. Who can tell me? Between the condition and also the pillar. The difference between the two, you guys already mentioned it. Huh? The intention between the condition and also the pillar. Mm. So the condition comes before the act of worship and the pillar is inside the act of worship. That's the difference between the two. What's that which they have in common or the common feature or the common denominator between the two? If you want to use mathematical terms which you use a lot in faraid, inheritance. Huh? Good. If you don't come with any of them, whether it is a condition also a pillar, whether it is left off out of forgetfulness or intentionally, that act of worship is what? Invalid. Right? You just finished praying. Four long raka'at because you were reading. Huh? You're weird. 
that which you would read on a daily routine. You read the whole juz. For Isha, for example. After the salah, you remember, oh, I didn't make wudu. Don't worry. رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا إِنَّ سِينَ وَأَخْطَأْنَا Right? The verse in the Quran, oh Allah, do not hold us to account for what we've done out of forgetfulness, or out of mistake. Don't worry. Let me go to sleep. Is that all right? Are you pardoned in this kind of situation? Of course, in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal, you're not going to sin for doing something out of forgetfulness or out of mistake. Does that make sense? However, you must still go back and do it. You can't use this card of, oh, you know what? I did it out of forgetfulness. If you leave off the condition, like in this particular example. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? For some reason, I remember... I walked into the haram and I was taking a nap. And then I woke up, I realized, oh, at the time of the salah, quickly made wudu and I walked into the masjid. For some reason, I decided when praying to face Masjid al-Aqsa, the opposite direction. And you know why I done that? Because Sheikh Muhammad Mukhtar al-Shanqiti was sitting there doing the class. I don't know. For some reason, I decided to just go and pray it's a big class. I'm praying there like that. Facing the Qibla is a, was the, what is it? Pillar or a, it's a, it's a condition, sah? that has to be. I remember the Sheikh started doing this in front of everyone. Everyone's like, what's the Sheikh doing? Huh? And then the penny dropped. Shall I just turn around now and start praying towards the Kaaba? No, I didn't come with the condition. I have to make sure that I'm facing the Qibla. And I start the salah. Right? I'm not excused for doing something due to, I don't know, my head being all over the place for some reason. I would have to what? Make sure that I come with the condition properly in order to fulfill that act of worship. May Allah Azza wa Jalla allow us to go back to the haram. It's not easy when you get used to maybe what, six years in and around the haramain for it to be just be taken away from you just like that. Inshallah we'll We'll all meet there, inshaAllah ta'ala. Huh? And if Allah Azza wa Jal does not unite us in the haram, may Allah Azza wa Jal reunite us in a place that is far greater, Jannatul Firdaus al-A'la, the highest part of the Jannah. Tayyip, let's go into the conditions, inshaAllah ta'ala. Number one, an niyyah the intention. The intention, my beloved brothers and sisters, is a prerequisite that one must come with. Famous hadith that we've all come across in the path when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ أَيْ لَا يُقْبَلُ أَيُّ عَمَلٍ إِلَّا بِنِيَةِ No action is accepted from an individual except if he has a correct intention. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? Abshir, ya Sheikh, Abshir. Inshallah ta'ala, the break will be in five minutes for Dhuhr in Brixton Mosque. Yeah? So the niya, brother and sister, is what? A prerequisite that one must come with. Why are you making wudu? Are you making wudu because you want to just um, freshen up? Sheikh, shall we get your chair, Sheikh? Huh? Sheikh, you don't want to be on camera with me. Yes. <laughs> Is a prerequisite that one must come with. When you're making wudu, are you doing it in order to freshen up? On a hot summer's day, sometimes you walk into the bathroom and you start making wudu just so you could freshen up. And sometimes you have a shower because you want to freshen up. Tayyib, one woke up now, he took a shower. And then he realized, oh, I was in the state of Janaba. Oh, but that shower that I took, inshallah ta'ala, should do the job. Has he now removed the major spiritual impurity? He has to come with the intention. I know we're just like overlapping with ghusl here, but the concept is one. I remember in al Medina, when it rains, it rains, brothers. When it rains, it rains. And remember also you're what? Wearing sandals. And because of how much it's pouring, your feet will get washed. And even there are so many puddles on the courtyard of the haram. So you might end up washing your face 
and your hair as well, you might just do that. And, uh, and then maybe because you're wearing what? Short sleeves, you end up washing your hands up to your elbows, your elbows included. Right? And if you follow the Shafi'i Madhab, madmada, rinsing your mouth and also uh, sniffing water up your nose isn't something that is mandatory. And then you realize, oh, it's the time of the salah. Did I wash everything? Yes, I did. Khalas, let me just go and pray. Yasrah. Is your wudu valid? Even if you're Shafi'i. No, it doesn't. So the intention must be there. Make the intention, and then if it rains and it pours, and then it ends up washing that which needs to be washed. And according to the Hanabi, you have to make sure you rinse your mouth and your nose as well, right? In that case, maybe we can find you what? Huh? A solution. So your salah can be valid. But we'll come on to all of that, inshallah ta'ala. Another very common, um, another common scenario is swimming pool. One jumps in and then jumps back out. Oh, it's the time in the salah. Can he pray like that? Providing he had the correct intention when he started or when he jumped in, into the swimming pool. Does that make sense? And also other things as well that must be made mention of. But I think you guys get the gist for the first point here. The intention must be there. Of when you are making wudu. Does that make sense? Like, any questions on the first point? I think it's pretty clear, right? Or any questions on anything that we've taken so far? طيب. Number two, al-aql. Sanity. Right? And this is a condition for every act of worship. It's a condition for every act of worship. He must be sane in order for that act of worship to be valid. Sometimes parents say, you know what? Let me just take him on Umrah. Inshallah ta'ala, he'll get the reward for it. No, he's not sane. The pen has been raised from three kinds of people. One of them is someone who's lost his sanity up until he gains back his sanity. Does that make sense? The insane child is not like a minor that you may get rewarded for when taking him on Umrah. And sometimes they even want to make wudu for this insane individual. He's not getting a reward for it. And you're not getting a reward for that as well. So the sanity, brothers and sisters, is what extremely important. That is taken into consideration. Otherwise, it's just unnecessary taklifa. As they say in Urdu. Right? Even in Arabic, they say taklif, sah? So it's unnecessary, bad, unnecessary type of burden that you're forcing upon yourself. Does that make sense? Number three, ma'al islami. Al Islam. It's important that we make mention of this, right? In Usul al Fiqh, you, you study a chapter. Hal al kuffaru mukhatabun bi furu' shari'ah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives out instructions in the Quran, are the kuffar being addressed or not? This is a discussion amongst the Usuliyun. Right? It's one thing as to whether the act of worship will be valid or not. It's another, my brothers and my sisters, the discussion of, are they being addressed? And if they are being addressed, are they going to be punished for it? This kafir, my brothers and my sisters, when Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Establish the salah. Is it also, is he also being addressed? Yes, he is. And this kafir, my brothers and my sisters, every time, the time when the salah comes by, and he doesn't pray, he will be punished for it on Yawm Al-Qiyamah on top of him not accepting Al-Islam. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? And likewise, if he has a lot of money and a whole year has gone past, right? And a whole year has gone past and this money that he possesses has reached the threshold, the nisab, and he doesn't pay, he's going to be punished for it. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? It shows the severity of their punishment. Right? And our evidence for this is? Uh, what's our evidence for it? will not give me the verse in the Quran.
ما سلككم في سقر قالوا لم نكن من المصلين it is said to them right what has caused you to be in the pits of the hellfire the response would be we never used to pray قالوا لم نكن من المصلين ولم نكن نطعم المسكين and we also never used to feed the poor right وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين and we used to deny the hereafter the day of resurrection and that's an act of kufr they're not even muslims the fact that they used to deny it shows that they were kufar and the fact that they never used to also feed the miskin they're being punished for it they're being punished for it does that make sense brothers and sisters that's 20 past inshallah ta'ala and we'll come on to um you know the next part of why islam is a condition that must be met inshallah ta'ala after the break bi idnillahi al bari طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا This is inshallah ta'ala the second lesson of this 59 poem that has been authored by our beloved sheikh عامر بهجت حفظه الله تعالى ورحمه May Allah عز وجل have mercy upon him and also preserve him So we reached the uh, part where we were going through the conditions of the wudu. What were the conditions that we have taken so far? Intention. Let me ask you guys a couple of questions pertaining to the intention. If one now makes wudu in order to read Quran or to sit in the masjid or for any other act that would normally be sunnah and then it occurred to him that he needs to pray an obligatory prayer has his Spiritual impurity been lifted from him? And when he was making the intention, he was doing it in order to carry out this sunnah act. Not the obligatory act, his intention was to carry out the sunnah act. Ma ra'yukum, what do you guys think? You have Qiratul Quran, right? You also have, for example, he wants to go to sleep. You know, you would make wudu, sah, when you go to sleep. Is it wajib? Is it mandatory? To make wudu before going to sleep? And then it occurred to him, oh, you know what? I need to quickly pray my Isha prayer. I forgot to pray. Or when you get angry now. Is it sunnah to make wudu in this situation? Naam. To extinguish that fire after becoming infuriated. To make wudu in this type of situation is a sunnah. Are you now in a state where you can carry out your obligatory prayers? If the intention was Raf al-Hadith, but he specifically intended to carry out wudu for this sunnah act. That was his intention. Hmm. Yeah. The khulasa is that it does uplift the spiritual impurity. Just in case one may be thinking whether it does or not. Tayyib, if somebody now, while making wudu, he doubts as to whether he has washed one of the pillars or not. He doubts while he's making the wudu. What does he have to do here? He has to restart. He would have to restart. Tayyib. The intention, where does it normally take place? On one's tongue or inside of his heart? The place of the intention, my brothers and my sisters, is in one's heart. Does that make sense? Taib. And likewise, I think it's worth pointing out, was it ever uttered by the Prophet ﷺ himself? Was it uttered by the companions? Was it uttered by the tabi'een, the atba'u tabi'een? Nor did the four madahib utter it themselves. Even Imam al-Shafi rahmatullahi alayhi kama qala al-Bayhaqi. Just as Imam al-Bayhaqi was a Shafi'i himself, right? Even to him you can't attribute it. That he actually done it. There are scholars within the madhab who later on uh, concluded that this is something that should be done. Lakin al-Shahid wal-Khulasa point in the conclusion to this issue is 
that they never done it. And the intention, its place is the heart, not necessarily the tongue. And Allah Azza wa knows best. طيب, then the second condition that we took is al-aql, sanity. And we made mention of someone losing his sanity. What if someone, my brothers and my sisters, becomes extremely drunk? Has he lost his sanity? To the point where he becomes fully drunk. He would also be considered to be in a state. What if one is tipsy? For lack of better terms, this is a type of term that is used, sah? Which is a little bit tipsy. Or is there another more correct, respectful term that is used? Intoxication is a bit of a, you know, general term. We need that which is more specific. Someone takes a pint or two. Huh? I don't think you become fully drunk where you're wobbling around, right? Or you're rolling around at the bus stop. Like you would see normally by the Fajr. He took a little bit and then he's a little bit tipsy. Hmm. I think you guys get the gist anyway. And then we spoke about Al-Islam. We covered one mas'ala. Halal kuffar mukhatabun wa firu' al-shari'a. Are the kuffar being addressed when Allah Azza wa Jal gives out instructions? Yes, they are. And they will be held to account for every time that they leave of the salah or that which is an obligation upon them if they qualify. And likewise, my brothers and my sisters, if a non-Muslim decided to pray, does he get rewarded for it? No, he doesn't. That's pretty obvious. As Allah says in the Quran, وَمَن يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلُ مِنْ Whoever accepts other than the religion of Islam or desires other than the religion of Islam is not being accepted from him. وَمَا مَنَعَهُمْ أَن تُقْبَلَ مِنْهُمْ نَفَقَاتُ إِلَّا أَنَّهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَبِرَسُولِهِ The reason why they're nafaqat because Quraysh they used to give charity. The reason why it wasn't accepted from them is because they disbelieved in Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So your good deeds are haba'an min thura on yawm al-qiyamah are like scattered particles if you don't come with al-iman. How many conditions are there for an accepted action? Normally two is mentioned but the third is pretty obvious. The scholars they mention al-Islam. In order for your Act of worship to be accepted, there has to be what? Islam. Also what? Ikhlas. You have to do it sincere, sincere for Allah Azza wa Jal. And third is what? It has to be in line with what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with. No matter how pure your intentions are. Well, I've got good intentions. La, it has to be in line with the Sharia. Don't turn our religion into the religion of the Christians. People don't actually realize how serious innovations are. When you open this door of innovation, you are allowing your religion to become like the religion of the Christians. Agreed? You have gay pastors, brothers, trying to justify him being gay. Every now and again, they decide to what? Introduce something into the religion. So much so that the religion, brothers and sisters, has become so tampered with, it has lost its identity. So if you have ghayra, Protective jealousy over your religion. Be somebody who preserves it. From anything that is going to what? Change it. And our blueprint of this religion is pretty clear. We have the companions who witnessed the wahi, the revelation coming down, and they worshipped Allah Azza wa Jalla a certain way. And as Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentioned, كُلُّ عِبَادَةٍ لَمْ يَتَعَبَّدْ بِهَا أَصْحَابُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فلا تتعبدوا بها. Every act of worship that the companions did not worship Allah with and don't worship Allah Azza wa Jal like that. Naam. Ma'al Islami. Number four. Ma'un tahurun. The water has to be what? Tahur. The water has to be tahur. There are three types of water, brothers and sisters. And you may think to yourself, how is this even relevant to someone who is living in the UK, was born in the age of millennials? We have pure running water that comes out of our British pipes. Inshallah ta'ala will make a lot of sense. There's a war going on in Ukraine, right? 
Do they have running water now, you think? In a lot of places? Bombs are falling huh? on the central water system. Time you're in a situation now, you may have to make wudu. This will come in extremely handy, inshallah ta'ala. I, for four years, brothers and sisters, didn't have running water. And I'm not different to you, brothers and sisters here. We had to deal with it. Fill up buckets with water. And the water would run through the pipes maybe once every three days or once every two days, depending on the climate at the time. طيب, you have three types of water, brothers and sisters. Number one, that which is tahur. That which is what? Considered tahur. It is a type of water that has come down from the heavens and has remained in its original form. وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً لِيُطَهِّرَكُمْ بِهِ And Allah Azza wa Jal sends down water from the heavens in order to purify you. This type of water is the only type of water that you could use to purify yourself. To remove the spiritual impurities and also the visible physical impurities so that you may be in a state where you can now make wudu. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? This is the only type of water that you could use to remove the spiritual impurities and also the visible physical impurities. I'll give you guys some examples, inshallah ta'ala, in a moment. But did everybody get that? The water came down. You have a river. Water is coming down. You have this running river, which you now want to make wudu with. Are you allowed to make wudu with that? Yes, you can. You are at some beach, which is of course a sea, sah. Are you going to say, oh, wallah, it could be salty, it could not be. I don't know, somebody may have urinated inside of it. La, that sea is a type of water that you could make wudu with. Does that make sense? Ayyib. Then you have a type of water that is considered or rendered tahir. Write that down as well. You have a type of water that is tahir. Does that make sense? How does the water move from being tahur to tahir? Jameel. وطاهر وهو الذي تغير من خلط طاهر به فأثر as صاحب النظم الجلي mentions طاهر brothers and sisters is a type of water that comes in contact with pure substances which causes one of three things to change the way I remember these three things brothers and sisters is by getting the three letters and saying STC which is an internet company in Saudi Arabia. You know how you have EE and Vodafone? In Saudi Arabia, we have a huge internet telecommunications company called STC. What does STC stand for? Smell, taste, and color. But according to the Saudis, it has another meaning. Allahu alam what it stands for. Saudi telecom, I think that's what it stands for. <laughs> no. Saudi telecommunications. I'm assuming is that probably right. Because it's a huge one. Right? They say it's one of the leading internet or telecommunication companies in the country. But what these letters stand for me is smell, taste, and color. I will never forget that because of this internet company that I dealt with. If now this water, brothers and sisters, comes in contact with a pure substance and it causes one of these three things to change, this water is no longer considered tahur. Does that make sense? For example, now you happen to enter into a bathroom, a public bathroom. And of course, in these bathrooms or in these toilets, they don't have bottles. They don't have these, I don't know what you guys call it. Huh? in Somali. <laughs> Whatever they call it. 
It's not a shelf, is it? They don't call it that. A jug. Allah says, use the term jug. They don't have these jugs because these kuffar, they don't clean themselves, do they? Huh? Every time I come to the chapter of Istinja, I go on for 10 minutes speaking about the purity of this religion and how it's so hygienic. You have a non-Muslim that walks into these public toilets, stands up when urinating, huh? pulls up his trousers, and he might go two, three days without washing himself. Because there's no need for him to wash himself, right? He might even go have intimacy with his partner. With all that filth and dirt. The point of the matter is, why did I mention all of that? How did I get to all of that, brothers? Yes, the type of water that is what? Tahir. Naam. You go into these public toilets, and then the only thing that you have with you is lukizate. After finishing, you relieving yourself, right? You remember, oh, sink is all the way there. I would have to probably get up and, and by that time you might impurify yourself with all the najasa that's coming out. But then you say, you know what? I've got a Lucozade bottle. So Lucozade in there. Let me just use that to clean myself. What do you guys think? Is that all right? Would I now enter into a state where I'm fit to make wudu? Like I said earlier, the only type of water that you could use to uplift the spiritual impurity and also the physical impurities is a type of water that is tahur. If the water comes in contact with these different substances that is used to make lukizate, Allah what they put in there, right? Is it now impure? Is lukizate impure? No, it's not. You can drink it and you can do whatever you want with it. But the only thing that you can't do is to remove your spiritual and also your physical impurities. Likewise, when you have squash water or squash juice, what do they call it? That uh, Robinson. It's a mixture of water and also these powders, sah? Came in contact, it changed. This water is no longer considered tahur. Again, going back to what I mentioned right at the beginning. How is this relevant to every single one of us? You may think this is a little bit out of touch with reality. Putin has been threatening the UK guys. as going to blow them up with nuclear weapons. And we might go back into time. Huh? How civilization used to be hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And it may well be that we go back to filling our buckets with water. These ahkam come in extremely, extremely handy. Right? There's even a time, subhanAllah, me, because my mind is just, you know, fiqh trigger, or trigger fiqhi, however you want to call it, right? Whenever something happens, masail come to my, uh, to my head. We had water. She would normally jump in there to, you know, to play around with water. It's like a small little swimming pool that we had in the living room. And then sometimes she would take a drink and pour it inside. Now, if you wanted to use that to make wudu, can you? Uh, and I come on to the issue of Qulatayn. It is water maybe the size of this. That she would jump in as a small little swimming pool. In the house, this big. She takes what? Coca-Cola and then she pours it inside. Can I now use that? Why? The determining factor, brothers and sisters, is if one of the three things changes. That's what I need to look at. When it comes to this category of water called Tahir. Make sense? Tayyip. There's something else I'm going to mention. Up until this point, I mentioned it in the first Vandoma. This is a point that Al-Mar'i, Al-Karmi in his kitab, Al-Dalil Al-Talib makes mention of. الْأَصْلُ فِي الْمَاءِ إِذَا تَغَيَّرَ بِطَاهِرٍ فَإِنَّهُ يُصْلَبُ مِنْهُ الطَّهُورِيَةِ إِلَّا إِذَا تَغَيَّرَ مِنْ ثَلَاثَةِ أُمُورِ The base ruling is that if water comes in contact with a pure substance, then the attribute of it being tahur is stripped away from it unless one of three things causes it to change. 
Does that make sense? Unless one of three things causes it to change. The first one is بطول المكث If you have water that has remained in a place for a very long time. Ask me brothers, I used to fill huge containers with water. Because of it being there for a whole week, does it always stay the same? Now that it's changed, can I use it? These are three scenarios that have been exempted. These are three scenarios that have been exempted. I never mentioned this when I went through the first poem, level one. But I'm adding this now. You have water. In Al-Yemen, and we used to have these huge barrels of water. Sometimes the water cuts. Two weeks it doesn't come. It's rare, but it can happen. But then you have to what, live on that water for cooking food, for washing your clothes. Uh, it's life, brothers. It disciplines you. It's a bit tough, but with talab al-ilm comes these struggles. Right? It really, really has a huge effect on the type of individual you end up becoming. It's like taking a fast track to maturity as well. طيب. Because it's been in there for the last week, it begins to change. What did we say? Smell, taste, or color? Even if it tastes, it's a little bit different. Here, that which is being exempted is if it remains somewhere for a long time. Number two, brothers and sisters, you have water somewhere because there's a dead animal, not inside, but next to it. It is next to it. That smell causes it to change. It never came into direct contact here, brothers. And this perhaps is the difference. It never came into direct contact. It is there. That stinking smell, you see it what? Roaming around this water. This also doesn't change it from being tahur to tahir. Third scenario that is exempt, my brothers and my sisters, is أو بما يشق صون الماء عنه كطحلب أو ورق شجر ما لم يوضع. Does everybody know what moss is? From knows what moss is, right? Everybody knows what a leaf is from a tree, right? You go to some parks. Like in Leicester, we have this park called Abbey Park. You have trees. You have huge waters, right? And sometimes what happens, and this is something that is natural, right? From Allah Azza wa Jal, moss starts appearing on the water. Huh? Would you guys agree now that the water has changed? One of the three things has changed, right? Again, this is one of those out of the three scenarios that makes it exempt. Does that make sense? Moss or if leaves fall into it, which could cause the taste to change and the color to change as well. It becomes a little bit more greener. As long as you personally don't put it inside, it's fine. It is exempt and you can use that water. Yeah, these natural things, moss and, you know, labas. Algia? I don't know what that is. Yeah, the green stuff. Yeah, I mean, these are all natural uh, things. Does that make sense? So anyways, if you didn't get that, don't worry about it, inshallah ta'ala. The asal is that if the water comes in contact with a pure substance, which causes one of the three things to change, it is no longer fit for one to remove his spiritual impurities and the visible physical impurities with. Likewise, maraq. You guys know what maraq is? Be the hilly blue karkaria. Huh? You have water, and then, you know, lamb is used to cook it in, inside of it, which causes it to change. Can I now use it? My samar is good, right? Huh? Tayyip. I'm still learning. Again, here the water has changed. Tell me, ask you guys another question. In the washing machine. There's a mixture of water and also soap. That's now used to remove the visible physical impurities of your clothes. After doing so, can I use it? Oh. 
طولني بقى لما السنه خلي تصخ بقى نفس ثاني ها خليه بيهنجن ها Remember we said in order to you know and the water has to be tahur when removing likewise the visible physical impurities and but now this water has come in contact with soap one of three things has changed mm, don't worry طيب the third type of water is what a type of water called najis it is impure it is impure and by the way inshallah ta'ala for every hour we'll have Uh, a five minute break inshallah ta'ala to get the blood circulating again طيب ماء النجس a type of water that is what? impure and this is of two types this is what? of two types the first type that which is less than قلتين that which is less than if you translate قلتين literally it means two barrels of water Then how can we approximate it? The poet he says, "Our Sheikh Amr Bahjat, he has some line of poetry. Well, قل تاني بعد تسعين مئة لتر وكيل من مياه بارئة, a hundred and ninety liters." I know, brothers, you guys are going to say you went through this book and you had another measurement. You may find two hundred and eight or two hundred and nine and a hundred and something else. Let's just go with a hundred and ninety liters now. To make or to keep things simple, anything less than a hundred and ninety liters is less than قل تين. Anything more than it is more than قلتين. Does that make sense? Now, speak about that which is less than قلتين. بمجرد ملاقاه. The fact that it merely comes in contact with impurities. You have water. Like this. But you can see this water. A drop of urine falls in it. Is that going to now change? The smell, taste, the color? No, it's not. One drop? Come on, guys. I don't think you guys have tried it, huh? Sorry, you probably not. I haven't tried it as well, but uh, I think everybody gets the point. One drop of urine falls into it. Or even more than that. Let's just say we have 150 liters. It's a lot. Is it going to impact it? It's not. One drop. This type of water, brothers and sisters, is actually now considered what? Nijis. Impure. Does that make sense? Likewise, if you have cloves, you have this barrel of water that I had in Yemen, and then your cloves that were impure came in contact with it. Naam. All of that water has now become impure. Does that make sense? It may well happen, brothers. Don't look at it as something that's out of touch with reality. People in Ukraine are currently going through it. And I wondered to myself, because I said to you guys, I'm very fiqhi minded, right? How are they making wudu? Some areas you walk outside, you probably get shot. Are they collecting water in barrels? Allahu alam. Hmm? Tayyib. I'm coming to it. I'm coming to it. Yeah? Second type now is That which is more than 190 liters, more than قلتين. More than قلتين. If impurities now come in contact with that which is more than 190 liters. What happens here? What's the ruling? Uh, Yahya. Jameel. It is only rendered impure if one of the three things change, smell, taste and color. STC. Does that make sense? Only if one of the three things change, only then it is rendered impure. And I go to swimming sometimes, right? These indoor swimming pools. You got a guy urinating or excreting in the corner of the swimming pool. Is that water in a swimming pool more than 190 liters? Very likely it is, right? Does that make sense? If one of the three things changed only then, it is considered najis. And this type of water, you're not allowed to use it. You have to pour it down the drain. You can't use it to clean your living room. If you have wooden floor, for example, right? You can't use it for anything. You have to get rid of it. 
As for the second category, which was tahir, you can use it for everything else other than removing these spiritual impurities and physical impurities as well. So we have three types of water. Number one, which is tahur, as the only water that you could use to remove the visible physical impurities and also the spiritual impurity, whether it's minor or major. Number two, tahir. It's a type of water that came in contact with pure substances, which has caused one of the three things to change, STC, smell, taste, and color. And we mentioned three scenarios that are exempt. And number three, nejis. Right, the type of water in nejis, that which is less than 190 liters, and that which is more. Anything that is less than 190 liters, if it comes in contact with impurities, straight away, whether it changes or not. Whether one of the three things changes or not. Does that make sense? Or if it's more, you would have to wait for one of the three things to change. Number five, this is my favorite one. Minsi wal harami. This type of water cannot be haram. Or in more clearer terms, right? It has to be permissible for you to use. And there's two things that is considered here. The money that you use to buy this water. And the second thing is, the water itself has to be lawful for you to use. So you can't actually go and steal water. Like he walks into the corner shop and then steals the water. And then decides to start making wudu with it. لا. Here, this fifth condition, وَهَذَا مِنْ مُفْرَدَاتِ الْمَذْهَبِ Right? It's from the things that Imam Ahmad's madhab is by itself on. Right? This water has to be what? Lawful or permissible for you to use. So we spoke about two things, right? The essence of water and then also the money that you used to buy that water. What do you guys think I'm going to say? Let's speak about benefit fraud for a moment. According to what we just, bought, uh, we just studied, that woman who cheats the government, all of her wealth now becomes haram. And then she uses that money to pay the water bill. And I ask you guys a question. Here, if you don't pay the water bill, do they cut it from you? You lose hot water. I don't think anyone's going to make wudu on a cold winter morning with other than hot water, are they? طيب, let's just say, for example, they would have cut the water. Huh? They would have cut the water. طيب, this woman now who's using this haram money to pay her water bill. How would you think of her wudu? According to what we are studying, I don't know there's some other intricates in the method as well, but I remember I went to three sheikhs. I was like, Sheikh, we have this situation in the, in the UK. And one of my teachers looked at me because he's also from the UK, right? And he was like, you and your weird way of thinking, huh? how did you even come with that example? <laughs> it's like, it is what it is, right? Comes in handy eh, when you study fiqh. طيب. And their reasoning for it is Whatever is based on falsehood is also what? False. Does that make sense? And is this principle هل الأمر or should I say هل النهي يقتضي الفساد هل النهي يقتضي الفساد Does that make sense? This is uh, might confuse you guys, but you study it in Al Qawaid al Thiqiya. وإن تتحريم في نفس العمل أو شرطه فذو فساد وخلل. This nahi, this prohibition, if it goes back to a condition of something, or it goes back to the essence of that act of worship, then it would be considered what invalid as well. Now the issue of the water is a condition, and there's what a prohibition that goes back to it. فكل نهي عاد للذوات أو للشروط مفسدا سياتي وإن يعد لخارج كالعمة فلن يضير ففهم من العلة. Right, we'll come on to it إن شاء الله تعالى maybe another time. The sixth condition, brothers and sisters, is إزالة المانع من وصوله. You have to make sure that you remove anything, anything that stops the water reaching that which needs to be washed. 
Give you guys a couple of examples. Paint. Huh. Does that now stop the water? It's not no stop the water from reaching that which needs to be washed. Yes, it does. You have to make sure that you remove it. طيب, what about Nivea cream? Like I'm a heavy cream new user. Every morning when I come out of the shower, I have to use a moisturizing cream, which sinks into your skin. Do I have to make sure that I remove that? Don't stop. Every time, you know, washing my my face, make sure that comes out of your face the moisturizing cream. Maraikum. See, there's a lot of shiny faces here that use cream. Huh? Or maybe it's just the noor of Qiyam al Huh? The noor of standing up in the night. Taib, huh? Maraikum. Jameel. The principle is, brothers and sisters, anything that puts a layer on top of that which needs to be washed. Everyone write that down. And whatever example is thrown at you, with this principle, it allows you to, to determine as to whether you have to remove it or not. Huh, what about face paint? You went to a uh, carnival or whatever and then you got a tiger face paint. Water soluble. Allahu <laughs> a'lam. If it puts a layer on top of the skin, you would have to what? Remove it. Tell you, let me ask you guys about makeup. BB cream. Foundation. Sis is probably laughing. How does he know all of that? Yes, I do. Huh? This layer that you put on top of the skin, huh? Makeup. Do you have to remove it? I think I'll point out my beloved brothers and sisters. I wrote an advice literally last night, sending it to some while going to be attending a wedding. On the wedding night, what tends to happen is a sister spends a couple of hundred pounds doing up her face. Agreed? If you want, that's entirely up to you. She wants to look the part. She's the bride or the relative of the bride. They want to look good. No problem. Providing this is what? Under the realm of the Sharia. Right? Going back and forth. Make sure you cover your face. Even if you're not a niqabi. You don't walk outside looking all beautified. You have to make sure that you wear niqab when going to the wedding. Covering your face and your eyes as well. If you have these eyeliners and these funky things that you put on your eyes. Messenger said, You cannot stop the woman from going to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal. You as a husband, you as a father, you as a brother. If they ask for your permission. However, when they leave, they have to leave unbeautified, unperfumed. Then what happens? They reach there around the Asr time and they're going to be doing a whole nighter. They're going to do an all nighter. How many prayers? Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. What's the likelihood that she's going to keep her wudu from Asr all the way till after Isha? Or even just to Maghrib? It is from the major sins to delay the prayer. I can't just say, you know what? I'm going to make up for all of my prayers at Fajr time. Well, like there was a sister I was told about. She was the one who was getting married, right? She had all her makeup and everything. It was a time of the Salah. She didn't have wudu. She decided to go and make wudu. But before she did, they gave her a very hard time, including her mother. Don't take off your makeup. Don't take it off. And she's saying, Allah, Allah. How can I prioritize the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal? I've been making dua for a whole year that Allah Azza wa Jal allows me to enjoy this particular night. And then I disobey him. I throw it back in his face. When we disobey Allah Azza wa Jal on this day, are we not like throwing it back in Allah Azza wa Jal's face instead of actually showing our appreciation? How many women actually go and take their makeup off on this night? They say it's just one night, one night. Every Eid we hear about somebody who died while jumping up and down to a tune or to some music or in a club. Every Eid we hear about it. Hmm? 
She goes into sujood. It was the last thing that she ever done. Brothers and sisters, imagine she never took her makeup off. Imagine she never made wudu. Imagine she never prayed. Does that make sense? Right? So the makeup must come off if you have lost your wudu. Right? If you want to hold it, it's up to you. Huh? Good luck in doing that. Huh? So that makeup needs to be removed. What about nail varnish? Oh, please don't tell me, brothers. Uh, there's waterproof. Some tests have been done and apparently it's not. Yeah, the halal one. Apparently it's actually haram. Huh? <laughs> what I mean by that is, يعني, not haram, haram. Women can use it, providing they're just doing it at home. But it doesn't actually make it waterproof. Some brothers don't. I think among them guys, they... And on a test, right? And others did as well that I came across. Tayyib. What else, brothers? What if you know somebody works in paint, is a painter? And every time the time of salah comes, it'll take a very long time to remove it. What do we tell him? Wear gloves. Does wearing gloves hinder your work? No, it doesn't. Hmm? Number seven, وَهَكَذَا الْخَارِجُ مِنْ سَبِيلِهِ You have to make sure that you remove any impurities that are coming out of the front or the back passage or from any other part of your body. You have to make sure that you what? Put a stop to it. Right? There's maybe two different scenarios. Number one, one is urinating while making wudu. He woke up late, 8.50 a.m. in the morning. He's only got 10 minutes left. He's got to save time. So I'm prayed Fajr. Runs into the toilet while he's urinating, he's making wudu. Huh? Can it happen? Brothers, you go to Saudi Arabia and other countries, you know they have these toilets that are the ground ones. And then there's a tap right next to it. <laughs> I remember when my teacher made mention of this, there was a brother in the class, Sheikh, what are you talking about? How is that even possible or logical? I'm looking at a guy, don't you have these toilets in the, in the dorm? In the dorms that we grew up in for the last six years, that's exactly how the system is. Go, huh? And then you have these toilets, right? But in these French toilets, the tap is very far. So it's maybe a little bit more unlikely. Does that make sense? So you have to make sure that that najasa is stopped. Right? Taib. That's the first scenario. Another scenario is. Can you make wudu before doing istinja? So you just urinated and then you decided, you know what? Let me go and make wudu. And then I'll go back and clean myself. La, you have to make sure that you not only do you put a stop to that najasa coming out, and also you have to make sure that you clean yourself, removing any visible physical impurities. Does that make sense? طيب, the next part, insha'Allah ta'ala. He then says, وَالْفَرْضُ غَسْلُ الْوَجْهِ وَالْيَدَيْنِ مَسْحٌ لِرَأْسٍ غَسْلُ كَرْنِجْلَيْنِ وَالْفَمَ وَالْأَنْفَ مِنَ الْوَجْهِ جَعَلَى وَالْأُذْنَ مِنْ رَأْسِكَ تَرْتِيبٌ وِلَى Now he moves on to the furud, that which is what? Fard. That which is a pillar. How many pillars of the wudu are there? Six, according to the Hanbali Madhab. There are six pillars of the wudu and there are evidences for each one. The first one that he mentions, my beloved brothers and sisters, is غَسْلُ الْوَجْهِ You have to wash your face. Let's turn over what washing actually entails. When we say you have to wash something or you have to wipe something, what does it actually mean? الْغَسْلُ my brothers and my sisters, when you understand this, it will save you from a lot of mistakes and will give you a very good idea as to whether somebody done wudu properly or not. Ghasl is jarayanul ma'i al al-udu. The water flowing on that part of the body that needs to be washed. Say that again. Everyone should be writing this down. The water flowing on that part of the body. It's a very, very commonly asked question and a common mistake as well. Our sisters, may Allah Azza wa Jal bless them, 
There are some sisters, mashallah, they pray at work. And because she's wearing makeup, she goes to the toilet and she does this. This is when it comes in extremely handy. Is this washing or is this wiping? Or should I say maybe touching? You have to make sure that the water is removed. Sorry. Whatever layer she's wearing, it needs to be removed by the water flowing on that part of the body. That's what washing means. When we say washing, you have to make sure that the water flows on a part of the body. As for al-masih, masih, which means the wipe, is imrarul yad al ala al It is to pass wet hands on that part of the body. To pass wet hands on a part of the body. Does that make sense? طيب. So you have to wash your face. This is the first one. Ya yudhina amni da qumtu min al-saadi faghusilu wujuhakum. When you stand up for the prayer, Oh, you believe? When you stand up for the prayer, make sure you wash the face. Where's your face? Horizontally, brothers and sisters, is from this part, look here. Can you see the area between the ear and also your sideburns? It is referred to in Arabic language as al-bayad. According to the majority of the scholars, this is part of the face that needs to be washed. So from there, all the way till here. Horizontally speaking. And also vertically is from where your hair would normally start. And that should be underlined normally. Huh? <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> where your hair would normally start. Because as you grow older, the hairline goes backwards. Sah? <laughs> huh? Your hairline goes backwards. Does that make sense? So does that mean he starts washing from here? All the way till la, where the hair would normally start up to your chin. Does that make sense? طيب. On your face you have hairs. Does that need to be wiped? Does that need to be washed? The principle is brothers and sisters. If you have a thin beard you have to make sure you wash the Outside and the inside as well. If you have a thick beard, you only have to wash the outside. And sisters, write it down as well. I know you don't have beards, but you have brothers, you have male relatives that inshallah ta'ala you're going to be guiding to that which is correct and inspiring. Always remember Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah's name is not Ibn Taymiyyah. His name is Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim. However, they were all attributed to this lady who used to give reminders, known for her righteousness. And I named my daughter Taymiyyah, may Allah Azza wa Jalla preserve her, hoping inshallah she'll become righteous. And then her male offspring will be attributed to her inshallah ta'ala. Naam. Sisters are in need of that which we're taking as much as the brothers. Sometimes your husband is uneducated and you have to put him straight. Right? You could be his key to al-Jannah. Does that make sense? I know, brothers, it can be a little bit ego touching, huh? For a sister telling you to do what, what is right. Walakin, هذا هو الحق. It's the truth. طيب. If it's a thick beard, you have to wash the inside and outside, right? Huh? You have to wash the outside, catching you out there. If it's a thin beard, you have to do the outside and also the inside. Like what determines whether my beard is a thick or a thin beard? Ah, oh, Yahya. Yahya, because you studied before, Khali. I attended my class before. Jameel, my beard is the perfect beard for this example. Say, Allahum barik. Before he catches fire. Huh? Like, look at my beard here. You have a type or a part of it where you can see the skin from behind. Can you see it? If you can see the skin, then this is what considered a thin beard. And then you have what? The lower part of it, which is considered thick or thin this part. Huh? Thick, because you can't see it, right? Can you? No, you can't. Does that make sense, brothers? If you can see the skin behind one's beard, it is considered thin. If you can't, it's considered thick. Like you have brother Ahmed. Is that a thick or a thin beard? 
Sound bad because all. Huh? Handsome brother. Huh? Taib, let's take another example. Huh, my brother here. Thick or thin? Thick. Our brother here. He's got a part that is thick and a part that is thin. Hmm? What about your eyebrows? Likewise, same reply. Huh? Same reply. Taib, we mentioned that the face is from here up to here. Some people have long beards. Again, my beard is a good example of that. That which comes under your beard. Sorry, under your chin. Do you have to wash it? Mastar salam in lihi it's called. That which comes down from the chin. Right? According to the majority of the scholars, it is considered part of the beard that needs to be washed. But what needs to be washed? The outside. It's mandatory. Mm, it is mandatory that you wash it. Number two, my brothers and my sisters, is al-waliyadaini. Washing the hands. Up to your elbows, your elbows included. Where does your hand start? From here. Sah? Up to the elbows. From here, up to the elbows. Is that okay? All right, brothers? Huh? The tip of your hand up to your elbows, your elbows included. What do you normally start with when you start your wudu? You wash your hands, huh? And then you rinse your mouth and then you do your nose and then your face and whatever have you. And then after the face, what happens? You wash your hands. But from where though? From here? Up to the elbows? From the fingertip, brothers and sisters. It's a very, very common mistake. You know when I realized that this is such a common mistake? There's a video that I released demonstrating this mistake on Twitter. Within two, three days, it got over a quarter of a million views. People are commenting, oh, I went to Madrasa and these ignorant teachers, they never taught us that. Not that you should be referring to your teachers like that. They wasted our time. Wow. 30 years I've been making wudu wrong. Our teachers never taught us anything. I remember a very huge personality being tagged. Is this right? Is this right? Shah Azam Hakim gives fatawa in that, right? They're tagging him. I'm waiting for someone to say something. Huh? Nah. Hafidhullah, may Allah preserve him. But no one said anything. Right? No one said anything. Shahid Mir Kalam, it went absolutely viral. Of how much of a common mistake this actually is. Right? So you have to make sure that you start from the tip of your hand up to your elbows, the elbows included, and it's a must, otherwise your wudu is not valid if you continue like that. Does that make sense? طيب. Number three, مسحن لرأسن, you have to make sure that you wipe your head. You have to make sure that you wipe your head. Earlier we spoke about washing, now it's wiping. Does that make sense, brothers? Wiping. What is wiping? What did we mention wiping is? White hands. So you put your hands under the tap and then you wipe. Not wash, wipe. Some even hold the view that if you wash it without wiping your head, it's not valid. But according to the Hanabila, it's makruh. And those who say it's not valid, they have a point. Because Allah told you to wipe. Allah told you to wipe, never told you to wash. He could have easily told you that, right? But he didn't. Some people, what they do is, they put their heads under the tub. Huh? Or in the swimming pool, they put their heads inside. So anyways, we mentioned that you have to wipe it. And you have to try and cover the majority of the hairs. And you make sure you cover the hair. But if there are hairs that you left out, don't worry, inshallah ta'ala, your wiping of the head is actually valid. We'll come onto the ear because he mentions it after. This is now pillar number three. Pillar number four, الرجلين, you have to make sure that you wash your feet. You have to make sure that you wash your whole feet up to your ankles, your ankles 
included. Ensuring also that the water reaches in between your toes. Especially if you have chubby toes. Right? Which happens? You have to make sure that the water reaches in between. Do you have to use your hands when washing your feet? No, you don't. You remember what we said? You have to make sure that the water flows. So if you now wobble your feet under the tap, like in these wudu khanas when you go to the masjid, just wobble it, right? Not wobble it, huh? Wobble it. You know, you move your feet under the tap. And then the water reaches every part. Is that sufficient? Good. It is sufficient. However, if the water can't reach in between your toes except by you using your hands, in that case, it becomes mandatory for you to use it. There's a qa'id in usul fiqh. إِذَا كَانَ الْوَاجِبُ لَا يَتِمُّ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ wajib. If you can't fulfill a wajib except by something, wajib means something that is mandatory, except by something, that something becomes wajib as well. I'm sure Sheikh Abdul Wahid went through that. Huh? Does that make sense? Like you have to pray in the masjid. We just prayed in Brixton Masjid, Masjid Mutaymiyah. Right? Is it mandatory to carry out the salah in the masjid? Yeah, according to some is. That's the correct view. They have to do it in the masjid. And you can't get to the masjid except by walking. You walking becomes wajib. Becomes mandatory. Even though generally speaking, walking towards the masjid is not wajib. Does that make sense? So if you can't fulfill something except by something, that by here, that something, becomes what? Mandatory. So in this case, using your fingers, making sure that the water reaches in between, becomes wajib as well. If that's the only way that you can make the water reach there. Does that make sense? So these are what four pillars that we've taken. And then he says, وَالْفَمَ وَالْأَنْفَ مِنَ الْوَجْهِ جَعَلَى When it comes to your nose and also your mouth, sorry, fam means mouth, not mouth, mouth. Al-fam means what? Mouth. Anf means nose. He says, make it part of the face. This is not an independent pillar, right? The nose and the mouth are part of the face. So he's basically, in other words, saying it is mandatory upon you to rinse your mouth and to do the istin shark, making sure that the water goes in the nose. I want you all to maybe split your paper into two and write on one side, bare minimum, and the other side, that which is more complete. Knowing the bare minimum, brothers and sisters, will enable you to tell or to determine if one's wudu is valid or not. Does that make sense? Many elderly think you have to wash each part of that which needs to be washed, like the face and the hands up to the elbows. The elbows include three times. And if you don't, they look at you as ignorant. And it's happened right before my eyes. A brother's in a rush. He just washes each one and then the old man is going crazy on him in the wudu khana. So now what is the bare minimum? In washing everything that has been mentioned once is the bare minimum. Did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam make wudu like that? By just washing it once? Yes, he did. Right? Hadith Ali ibn Talib. Even Imam al-Bukhari, he chaptered this hadith Bab al wudu marrat and marra. Making wudu and just washing it once, once. So it's fine. However, that which is more complete and more rewarding is to do it like Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu demonstrated. And the hadith is ma'roof. Washing each part three times, other than the head, of course, you only do that once. So the bare minimum is doing it once. Likewise, when it comes to the rinsing of the mouth, what is the bare minimum when it comes to mother mother? Making the water move inside of your mouth. Even if it is a slight movement, you have now covered the bare minimum. Does that make sense? Even if it is what? A slight movement inside of your mouth and then you spit it out, no problem. As for googling it, huh? that is more complete. It's a sunnah. And the fact that I'm saying, brothers and sisters, it's a sunnah 
It shouldn't mean that we take it lightly. The companions, they did it because it was a sunnah. Today we leave it off because it's a sunnah. Does that make sense? Then what about now when it comes to sniffing the water up the nose? I think sniffing water up the nose sounds a little bit off, right? Or should I say putting water in the nose? Huh? Even the slightest of water that goes inside of the nose, you've covered the bare minimum. Sniffing it up to the top, brothers and sisters, al-mubalagh fil istinshaq is what sunnah. Making go all the way to the top. You should do that unless you are fasting. Unless you are fasting. In that case, you've been told not to do so. وَبَالِغْ فِي الْإِسْتِنْشَاقِ إِلَّا أَنْ تَكُونَ صَائِمًا And then it says, وَالْأُذْنَ مِنْ رَأْسِكَ تَرْتِيبٌ وِلَا When it comes to the ears, make it part of the head. So you wiped your head. You have to make sure that you put, huh? Like this. And then the thumb from the back. You have to make sure that you do that. Does that make sense? So you wipe, and then like that. What if you're wearing an imama like myself, which goes around your neck? Do you have to do the ears? According to the Hanabila, it's mustahab, it's a sunnah, and it's not mandatory. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> Does that make sense? Does that make sense? What about if a sister is wearing hijab? She's outside. According to the Hanabil, and they are by themselves on this issue that a woman can wipe on a hijab. Right? A woman can wipe on a hijab. This is what Ummu Salam and some of the other female companions would do as authentically reported. So she can wipe over it. And I can wipe over it as well. For me, it's sunnah. And for them, likewise. Right? For them, likewise. Tayyib. We talked about the man's hair. What if he has long hair up to his shoulders? And likewise, a sister, she has long hair up to her shoulders. Wipe up to here. Wipe up to here. Anything more than that is not required. Right? Hadith Abdullah ibn Zayd. Bada bi muqaddami ra'si hatta dhahaba bihima ila qafah. He started from here, all the way up until his neck. All the way up until his neck. That's the bare minimum. To come back up is what the Messenger also done. And this is a practice of his, which you should do from time to time. I know someone's probably going to ask, is it sunnah now to wipe the neck? Is that what you wanted to ask? I'll come on to your question. And Hanafis, they say you wipe the neck. And then some of you guys may turn around in a Hanafi Mizdi and say, you guys are doing bid'ah. Huh? And cause a big fiasco in the Wudu Khana. Here the narration states, brothers and sisters, started from here and went all the way down to the neck. Like, don't they have an evidence now? According to the majority of the scholars, the neck is of two types. A part of the neck that is connected to your head. Agreed? Everyone touch your... Sah? Part of your head is connected to the neck, right? That needs to be wiped. And then there's a part that isn't. It's right here. But what I want you guys to understand, my brothers and my sisters, is this view didn't just come out of nowhere. Agreed? The Hanafi is just, you know what? wake up one day and said, this is what we're going to do. As some brothers, they make it out to be. This at least, brother and sister, teaches you to be open-minded. Ask. Don't just rush to saying bid'ah. That's a big statement. Hmm? Al-Imam Abu Hanifat rahmatullahi alayhi was an alim, the scholar. I will blast anyone, right? who tries to speak ill of him, even when it comes to his fiqh. Anyways, that's maybe another time we'll, we'll talk more about, inshallah ta'ala. Number five, brothers and sisters, tartib. It has to be done in order. 
It has to be done in order. You can't just decide, you know what, let me wash my feet and then I'm going to huh, do the face and then I'm going to do the hands and I'm going to come back. لا, it has to be done in order. What's my evidence for it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said, فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ وَامْسَحُوا بِرُؤُسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلُكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ Allah mentions, wash the face, wash the hands, then wipe the head and then wash the feet. The fact that a mamsuh, something that needs to be wiped, is being sandwiched by that which needs to be washed, don't you think that was done intentionally by Allah Azza wa Jal? Otherwise, He could have mentioned all the things that needs to be washed on one side and then wipe your head. Does that make sense? So it needs to be done in order. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi always done in order. Has it ever been reported that he would start from his feet and then he would go back up? No, so it has to be done in order. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? طيب. Number six, wila. أي الموالاء. It has to be done in quick succession. You're washing your face, you get a phone call from your American auntie across the pond on FaceTime. For 15 minutes, you're speaking to her on the phone. After you're done, what happens? He starts washing his hands. Yasrah. It has to be done in quick succession. Then what determines something being done in quick succession? Huh? Tayyib? Huh? If the stage before that dries on a normal temperature environment or weather, whatever you want to call it. It could be extremely hot. As you're making all the, everything is becoming dry. Like in Saudi Arabia. By the time you get into the mezzi, you're already dry. And you made wudu on the courtyard. By the time you get into the mezzi, on a very hot day, it's already dry. So what we're talking about is, on a normal temperature day, right? Or room that you're in, that's already now become dry. Does that make sense? Or maybe on a very cold night, if you make wudu, maybe an hour's time, you'll only become dry. Does that make sense? So you have to do it in quick succession. These are six pillars, brothers and sisters. What I think is important that I mention now is, if one doubts as to whether he's done one of these pillars, and I never mentioned this before when I taught another al asghar while he's making the wudu, he's doubting, have I done the face, have I not done it? What should he do? He has ta'nif, he goes and restarts. Does that make sense? He restarts. Taib, after you finish with that, wudu, you begin to doubt, did I do it, did I not? Mada yahsun? Mm. The principle is, Shaykh ibn Azimi rahmatullahi alayhi mentions, وَالشَّكُّ بَعْدَ الْفِعْلِ لَا يُؤَثِّرُ وَهَكَذَا إِذَا الشُّكُوكُ تَكْثُرُ the doubts that arise after having finished that act of worship, right, must be dismissed. You can cast it to the side. Cast that doubt away. Does that make sense? Likewise, brothers and sisters, if one is suffering from a lot of doubts, this is very, very important. Very, very important. Very common question. Isn't it so? People are always asking. I suffer from waswasa. The principle is, brothers and sisters, and I want everyone to write this down because people are in need of this information, right? Lahtiyata lil muswasi. Lahtiyata lil muswasi, which means, you know, when we make wudu, we have to make sure that we've done it properly, right? We have to ensure that it's done properly. That person who's suffering from waswasa, he doesn't take these steps. Make wudu, get out of the toilet. And if it means that we pull him out, we do so. Wallahi brothers, it's such a sad reality. There are people who walk into the toilet or into the bathroom half an hour before Fajr. And you know, by the time they get out, you know when that is? After the sun has risen. Only then they come out of the bathroom. It is a marad, it is a sickness. May Allah Azza wa cure the Muslimin from that. There was a brother, subhanAllah, his parents called me and they were like, we have this issue with him. His wife was going through a lot as well because of this difficulty or this problem that he had. I remember taking him to Masjid Quba. It's exactly what I mentioned. He spent hours in the toilet. I took him into the toilet and I made him make wudu. And he keeps saying to me, I don't think I've done it. And this brother has done it extremely well. 
But shaitan is whispering. Shaitan is telling him, oh, probably your trousers are impure. You know, some discharge has come out, giving him wasawis. He made it once and I pulled him out of the toilet. It wasn't a toilet, it was the wudu khana. Right? Pulled him out of the bathroom. I take him to Masjid Quba. Masjid Quba right in front. We're praying outside because of the corona period at the time. We need a mask to get in and I don't think we had masks. Prayed outside. I'm telling him, start your prayer. And he keeps telling me, no, I'm not in the correct state to be praying. I mean, him are going oh, back and forth. Everybody knows what's happening. I'll tell you guys something funny. Guess who walked past? Sheikh Ali al-Hudayfi. And he started shouting at us. What are you guys doing? Pray. I'm like, Sheikh, if only knew what I'm doing here. Huh? And then the Sheikh just walked into the masjid. We stood there up until I felt extremely embarrassed that the Sheikh had to shout out. It's a sickness that people are suffering from. He doesn't check as to whether he's done it properly. Makes wudu and gets out. Does that make sense? You can have your five minute break, inshallah. Ta'ala, five minute break. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. وصلي وسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا. This is now the third sitting on the poem of النظم البين which is a fifty line poem authored by our Sheikh Amir Bahjat حفظه الله تعالى. In the previous sitting, brothers and sisters, we spoke about the فروض. The pillars of the wudu. We mentioned that there are six pillars. Number one, the face, including the mouth and likewise the nose. Number two, the hands. Starting from the tip of your hand all the way up to your elbows, the elbows included. Number three, wiping the head. Number four, washing the feet up to the ankles, the ankles included. Number five is what? It has to be done in order. Number six. It has to be done in quick succession and we forgot to mention when wiping the head you also have to wipe the ears. A very important point that I would normally mention is what happens if you leave off even a little bit? Are you excused? Let's just say it's the size of a nail that you've left off on your feet for example in washing. There is a hadith, hadith Anas Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu there was a man who after making wudu left the size of a nail on his feet. What did the Messenger tell him to do? Go back and perfect your wudu. So you can't even leave a little bit. Right? And this is also evidence for removing anything that is going to prevent the water from reaching that which needs to be washed. Here he left of only what? A size of an ill. Let alone a woman who covers her whole face. Right? With makeup. طيب. So that's extremely important. Likewise, when it comes to the face, the hands, anything that is left off, right? You would have to go back. Then he goes on to say, وَاجِبُهُ تَسْمِيَةٌ مَا غَسْلِي he now speaks about the wajibat. We've already covered now the pillars, right? Pillars is that which you must come with. You leave it off unintentionally, you still have to come with it, right? And likewise, if you leave it intentionally, it is invalid. Now he speaks about wajib. The term wajib and also fard could be seen as synonymous. As Hafid al-Hakimi rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned, وَالْفَرْضُ تَعْرِيفًا رَدِيفُ مَا يَجِبْ كَالسُنَّةِ التَّطَوْعُ نَدْبُ السِّحِبْ Like synonyms. This is how it's normally used. Wajib and fard. However, the Hanabila, when it comes to the aspects of the wudu, they classify it differently. Fard is something, and I've already explained what entails it to be fard. And then you also have that which is wajib. طيب. Wajib, when you translate it, means mandatory. He has to say, Bismillah at the beginning. He has to say Bismillah at the beginning. This is considered or known as the Tasmiyah. According to the Hanabali, you have to say what? Bismillah at the beginning. 
And they have a number of evidences, mainly three hadith. The first hadith is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, لا وضوء لمن لم يذكر اسم الله عليه No wudu for the one who doesn't mention the name of Allah. And this narration was authenticated by Ibn Kathir, Al-Bukhari, Al-Iraqi, also Shaykh Al-Albani rahmatullahi alayhi and other than them. Ibn Taymiyyah likewise. They authenticated his narration. Right? I know there's a lot of discussion with regards to his authenticity. However, this is one of three hadith that they used to say it is wajib. And the Hanabila are of the four madahib, they are by themselves on this issue and it is the saver position. Either way, right, it is something that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam done based on these narrations that shouldn't be left off. Tayyip, you remember halfway through that you forgot to say it. What should you do? Restart. And this is the safe of you in the madhab. Tayyip, you remember after that you didn't do it. You actually know that you didn't do it. We're not talking about, oh, he's doubting. We're talking about he did not do it. What does he have to do? Does he have to restart? This is now the difference between fard and that which is wajib. You can see it is lighter upon the soul here. Right? They are more easy going with regards to it. And this is what is considered wajib. He doesn't have to restart. As opposed to if he remembered, oh, I didn't do my face, he would have to restart, which is a pillar. Type the second wajib that he mentioned here is غسلي كفيني من قيام نوم ليلي. Washing your hands. Washing your hands after waking up from the night sleep. Washing your hands after waking up from the night sleep. Here they specifically mention a night sleep. إذا استيقظ أحدكم من نومه فلا يغمس يده في الإناء حتى يغسلها ثلاثة فإن أحدكم لا يدري أين باتت يده When you wake up from your night sleep Sorry, he didn't say night sleep إذا استيقظ من نومه from his sleep Right? Then let him not dip his hands inside of the bucket of water Right? Only after washing it thrice Because you don't know فَإِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ لَا يَدْرِي أَيْنَ بَاتَتْ Here the term بَاتَ بَيْتُوتَ Not actually بَيْتُوتَ فَإِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ لَا يَدْرِي أَيْنَ بَاتَتْ يَدُهُ He doesn't know where his hands He doesn't know where his hands were throughout the night. I don't know where it was. If I want to be honest. Right? And here the term that is being used is he doesn't know where his, where his hands well, throughout the night. And because of that, they said the night sleep. Even though the same could be mentioned about the, uh, the morning siesta or the afternoon sleep and so on and so forth. Anyways, point of the matter here is, the Hanabila, they say the night sleep. Don't dip it inside. You have to wash it three times. And only then you can dip your hands inside of the water. Taib, today we don't have buckets in many places that we use. We have taps. Right? And normally at the beginning of the wudu, you wash it three times. So does it now become six? Ma'araikum. You can combine the intention. هذا ما يسمى بالتداخل في العبادات. Right? Where you have what? Acts of worship overlapping with one another. But because they are very similar, the sharia makes it easy. A little bit like, you know, when you have a shower, make the intention of removing the major spiritual impurity and also, you want to make wudu. Huh? It overlapped here with one another. As long as you make the intention, it's fine. Here, likewise, you make the intention. Normally, you would wash your hands three times. And also now, because you woke up from the night's sleep, you have to wash your hands three times. It is wajib. Make the intention of doing it together. And inshallah ta'ala, it should cover that which is required. It should cover that which is required. I hope that makes sense, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyip. Let's move on to... That which breaks your wudu. And it gets very interesting here. ينقضه الخارج من سبيل كالنجس الكثير للقليل ومس فرج دبرا أو قبلا بيده ولمس أنث رجلا وعكسه بشاوة كالأكل للحم إبل وزوال العقل 
وغسل ميت وموجبات غسل ولا تسأل سوى الثقات ويمنع المحدث مس المصحف ومن طواف وصلاة فارف قد يسز ينقض that which is going to break your wudu is as he mentions eight things the first thing my brothers and my sisters is al kharij min sabili al kharij min sabili anything that comes out of the two passageways whether it is the front or the back anything that comes out whether this is something that is normal or abnormal some of you guys are giggling why are you guys giggling whether it's normal or abnormal does it happen yes brothers and sisters i was one time asked a question the mother was saying she took the young child to the gp and then a worm came out of his backside the reason why she took him is because he felt a huge discomfort when sitting down and perhaps maybe because there's a worm that enters inside of it طيب the worm came out does it break his wudu is it something that came out yes it is whether it's normal or abnormal you decided to eat a small stone for whatever reason and then it came out even if it is not accompanied with any feces does it break it yes it does whether it's normal or abnormal i'm going to mention this example you guys are probably going to laugh but i mentioned it many many times due to the nature of who was attending the class it may well be brothers and sisters that one smuggles drugs does it happen طيب and he prays at the same time is that again possible without a shadow of a doubt well we had a brother who went on umrah with us he was running the drug dealing industry in east london He might be moving drugs from A to B but when the time of the salah is he stops the car takes out his sajada from the back starts praying. Does that make sense? They say at least three non-Muslims became Muslim because of that. They're like this guy doesn't get arrested. There must be something there. Huh? <laughs> Maybe because he prays. You guys with me? Hey, subhanallah a couple of them became Muslims. And he never left of the salah. And perhaps maybe because of that, Allah Azza wa Jal guided him. What does Allah say? Inna salat tanha, and if a shayi wal munkar, the salah removes the filth and evil from your life. I don't care if you are a prostitute that's working in a brothel, or a drug dealer, or a murderer. I don't care what sin that you're doing. The salah is there to better you. Shaitan whispers and says, "This is extremely hypocritical, right? Shouldn't be doing that. How can you pray and you're so impure?" devil's trap we pray because we want to better ourselves it doesn't matter what you are doing it's only a matter of time you see that you will become better does that make sense so if he's now swallowing drugs or the police raided his house huh? and the cocaine that he had he ended up swallowing does it happen it does happen and then he what excretes it out after the police leave and there's no feces that is accompanied with it these are practical examples brothers and i hope you guys are right now on the examples all of these examples that i give is what is going to make you teaching so much more understandable and enjoyable huh i love you guys are getting excited as i teach i see the face changes these examples are very important it makes it very relatable i could easily just rush through the mandoma tell you what we should do and we should not do these examples are very practical and when mentioning in lessons you can make it very very relatable we'll be coming on to some more relatable issues as well inshallah ta'ala in a short while طيب number 2 طيب before i go on to number 2 i remember our sheikh salih sindi he mentioned this in the haram you go to the doctor and they stick a thermometer that has cotton up your backside When the thermometer is taken out it comes out damp not watery no fluids come up but it just comes out damp huh 
Is it also broken? Why are you guys hesitating for? Did it go inside of your backside while it was damp? No, it didn't. But it came out damp. Isn't that something that came out? So it makes sense. So anything that comes out of the front or the back, whether it's tahir like many, spam, or that which is considered urethral discharge. For those who don't know urethral discharge, I'll translate that into English. Huh? That which comes out at the time of being aroused. That's what they call pre-semen. And then you have semen that comes out when one relieves himself. Does that make sense? So anything that comes out, whether it's normal or abnormal, blood comes out of your private part or your backside, this is all considered something coming out. That's the principle. Can najis al kathir ilal I'm going to answer your question. Don't worry. Can najis al kathir ilal qalili. The second thing, brothers and sisters, is impurities coming out of any other part of your body besides these two passageways. And what the madhab considers as impure and repulsive is blood, vomit, and number three, pus. Does that make sense? These three things. Blood, pus, and vomit. However, providing that it comes out excessive. What's my evidence for it? What Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah mentioned, إِذَا كَانَ الدَّمُ فَاحِشًا فَعَلَيْهِ الْإِعَادَةً If a lot of blood comes out, فَعَلَيْهِ الْإِعَادَةً It's upon him now to repeat the salah, meaning like inside of the salah. Right? وَإِنْ كَانَ قَلِيلًا فَلَا يَعَادَةً عَلَيْهِ If it is a little, then he doesn't need to repeat it. So he mentioned if this impurity is excessive and also repulsive, right? Only then you have to what? Repeat the wudu. Tell what is considered a lot and a little. Square no. <laughs> so if he puts his head, then he's just vomiting like that. And a lot is coming out, but he's not actually, you know, squirting. But you said square. Urf, okay. Huh. Mm. Abdullah ibn Abbas, great cousin of the Messenger of Allah, the scholar of this ummah, he said, Al-Fahish ma fahish fi nafs. Fahish meaning excessive is that which one considers excessive. So it is a judgment that he has to make. I'm sure everybody can do that, right? Something a little comes out, huh? and there's a lot coming out, and then you yourself have noticed that this is too much. Even thus, you know, it's something he has to determine. Because a lot can be a lot, but at the same time, it could be a little bit less, but still considered a lot. Huh? So it's a judgment that he has to make. Yeah? I could easily go into the evidences of each one and why and this and that, but نظم الجلي إن شاء الله تعالى. That's number two. Number three. ومس فرج دبورا أو قبلا. Touching the front or the back private part. I'm going to stand over this for a moment. إن شاء الله تعالى. It's extremely important. Hanabil mentioned three conditions in order for your wudu to break. Number one, the private part has to be connected. Why do you guys all look so confused? Isn't it possible for a private part to be disconnected? I'll tell you guys about an article that I read. I believe it was on the Washington Post. And don't laugh, huh? And like I said to you guys before, my antenna, whenever I read things, it goes somewhere to fiqh. I was reading this article. A lady caught her partner cheating. 
So she decided to deal with it by chopping off his private part. So what did she do? She took it and then she threw it in the park. Wallahi al brothers, sisters, I read this on an article. What came to mind? This mas'ala. <laughs> that the private part has to be connected. It comes in extremely handy, right? Now the police have come. They've instructed her to go and find his private part. They took her with him. They took her with them. This policeman or this doctor or this crime scene investigator, CSI, uh, has to now pick this up. Does he break it? He could be a Muslim. He's, gonna, he's about to pray. This is when the masala comes in handy. It is not connected here. Does that make sense? So the first condition is that it must be connected. I'm going to come to it. First condition is that it must be connected. Number two, brothers, in order for the wudu to break, he has to touch his private part using his hand, not his elbow or his wrist. You know, the hand is from here to the wrist, right? I'm talking about this part. Or his forearm. He used it to touch it. Or his thighs. And this is by ijma. By unanimous agreement that it has to be touched by the hand. Any part of the hand. When Allah Azza wa said, وَالسَّارِقُ وَالسَّارِقَةُ فَاخْتَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَا The male and the female thief. Make sure you cut the hands off. Where would you cut? The elbow? The Shafi'is, they say, only if you touch using the inside. If you do this, it's fine. I always refuse to study Asin. Huh? It was a Shafi'i. Taib, you got the hand, which is considered from the tip all the way up to your wrist. Any part of it, that's considered the hand. Third condition, brothers and sisters, direct contact. And evidence for it is when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hadith of Hurairah, Man afda biyadi la farji laysa dunu hijaman faqad wajib alayhi wudu. Whoever makes direct contact with his private part using his hand, the wudu has become wajib. The wudu has become wajib. Also the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man masa dhakarahu, hali tawadda. Whoever touches his private part, let him make wudu. Meaning it's must upon him to make wudu. Another narration, whoever touches a private part, a private part, he has to what? Go and make wudu. Does that make sense? It could be between spouses, it could be a woman cleaning her child. According to the madhab, she would have to what? Repeat her wudu. If you don't want the hassle of making wudu, which in fact, or in reality is a ni'mah, it's a blessing. Your sins are falling off every time you make wudu. If you don't want that hassle, maybe I shouldn't even be using that term. Go and use what? Either gloves or wipes when cleaning this child. Is it possible? Yes. It is. That you could clean it just using wipes. Does that make sense? So if you end up touching it, whether even that child is a child, or you happen to be cleaning Someone old in age. Does it happen? Got people working in this sector, right? It's to clean him. Old in age works in a care home. He has to what? Repeat the wudu. So whether it is the front or the back. When we say the back, we are not speaking about that which you would sit on. The cheeks. That's not what we're speaking about. We are speaking about the area where the feces would come out from. The hole. Excuse me, brothers, for using maybe or getting a bit too explicit. Otherwise, you'll never understand. For a very long time, brother, a brother said to me, and he's been going through books of fiqh. He goes, I thought it was the part that you sit on. That breaks your wudu. Maybe because the sheikh wasn't yeah, clearing what he was saying. God, our kids being taught about homosexuals and lesbians and whatever have you. Right, and then when it comes to this, we're going to be huh, adversive or shy. Allah is not shy of the truth. Of course, there are times where we can just use indirect terms. And the Messiah did do that. 
How about times if this is the only way that one is going to understand and there's no harm? Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala, she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she said, Inna Allah la yistahim min al-haq, Allah is not shy of the truth. Does a woman need to take a purificatory bath, a ghusl, if she has a wet dream? Umm Sulaim had She covered her face out of shyness. Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Naam, yes. If she sees that the place is wet, she has to do it. So you have to, even Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, she said, Ni'man nisa'u nisa'u al-ansar. The best of the women are the women of the Ansar. Shyness didn't stop them from gaining an understanding in the religion. That makes sense. You have to ask. وَمَسُّ فَرْجٍ دُبُرًا أَوْ قُبُلًا Right? Touching a private part. Also, I'll make mention of sexual abuse. Pedophilia, that which Islam condemns. Abusing young men and women. Likewise here, the wudu breaks. It could be that the individual then wants to go and pray. Right? But he's sick. Right? He's sick. He carries out this abhorrent, filthy, despicable act. Hmm? It's going to make wudu. We have to make mention of these scenarios, right? Does it now happen? Of course it does. Some people are sick brothers and sisters. How often do I receive messages from sisters who are abused? Right? And they say to me in the question that they're asking, my uncle prays, goes to the mosque. Shall I expose him? What shall I do? Shall I go to the police? And he prays. Even now, inshallah, when I go abroad to do my masters, one of the things I'm thinking about is to write down a thesis on the fiqhi related ahkam when one changes his gender. And then as my toba, does he go into the men's masjid or into the women's side? Ma raikum. There are ahkam, right? I need to cut that out because someone's going to take my idea. <laughs> <laughs> One of the hardest things is picking a topic and then it being accepted by the university. So I have to pick something fiqh related and it's good to maybe pick something that is relevant, sah? A lot of them, what, they're spending thousands of pounds. All his money is gone now. And then he came down to reality. Taib, I actually acknowledge that I am a man. Even though he removes so many different body parts. What does he do? Does he go into the male section or into the woman section? Right? What is a woman? Taib. So, duburan aw qubula. Biyadihi, if he makes direct contact with a hand. With his hand. Number four, brothers and sisters. Walamsu untha rajulan wa aksu bi shahwa. A woman touching a man and vice versa. If it's done with shahwa. With sexual desire. Does that make sense? If it is done with shahwa, with sexual desire. Does that make sense? It has to be done with sexual desire in order for the wudu to break. I'll tell you, I'm going to come on to that. The hanabila, they exempt the nails and also the hair. So if you're stroking your hair, huh? your wife, it's a romantic thing to be doing, brothers. Take note. Huh? Does it break it? No, it doesn't. Likewise, if you end up touching a nail, I don't know who would touch the nail with the, but this is mentioned in the books of fiqh. Huh? Yeah, there is, but Alan Nadr Sumalhab. Alhamdulillah, right? <laughs> so I hear. I'm so back. Now everybody can come here and benefit, you know? طيب. Even if you're from a different madhab, these examples, is it not going to come in handy? Just understanding the the the, the mas'ala itself, conceptualizing it. That's a huge aspect of fiqh. And then it's either for or against, huh? Maybe. This is what they mention in the books. But these two are exempt. But any other part that you touch with shahwa, huh? your wudu has broken. Does that make sense? There's a verse in the Quran where Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Oh, la mastumun nisa. You guys know the verse, right? Surah Al-Ma'idah. 
او لامستم which عبد الله بن عباس mentioned this is what sexual intercourse a wudu will break does that make sense طيب there's another قراءة this is when the قراءات come in extremely handy we don't just learn the قراءات because we want to sound silky right it has what احكام there's another قراءة قراءة حمزة كسائي and also خلف العاشر I believe that reads او لامستم which means to touch so the Shafi'i and also the Hanabila, they took this and they said, touching a woman breaks it. Just touching, whether it's with shahwa or not. This is an evidence that shows touching a woman, it breaks it. For those who are Shafi'i, may Allah help you guys. Huh? But then why did they say with shahwa? What's the evidence for it? Hadid Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, Ana kuntu anamu bayni yaday Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa rijlaya fi qiblatih فإذا سجد غمزني فقبضت رجلايا. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would pray because you know the house was small, right? And my feet would be in his direction and prostrate him. So whenever he went down, he would push it. Huh? Touched his wife, but did it break it? No, he didn't. Does that make sense? So the evidence that they used. No. So touching the opposite gender with shahwa. Does that make sense? Touching with shahwa. That's very, very important. Likewise, earlier I gave the example of a sick individual touching a young child with lust. This is what determines as to whether it breaks or not. If he touches with lust, does it break it? Uh, does it break it? Yes, it does. Breaks it. Okay. Mm. Likewise, if you're going into the shop and then you decide to touch the shopkeeper's hand when handing over the money with lust, it breaks it. But if you just, you know, drop the money and then you end up coming in contact with their skin, does it break it? No, it doesn't. Likewise, when it comes to Umrah, Shafi'is have it hard. Right? Shafi'is have it hard. You're doing what? Tawaf, you're bound to come in contact with the woman, especially when you go near the black stone. Right? Well, I've seen some things happen there. And as for Shadid, may Allah Azza forgive them. There was even a man that my good friend seen being what? Escorted out because of what he was doing to women around there. Hmm? A woman shouldn't even be going there. This is a sunnah. You shouldn't do something that's haram in order to fulfill a sunnah. Does that make sense? No. May Allah Azza wa protect us all. Say, what if, what if you touch her in a lusty way or in a lustful manner, but she doesn't, you know, she's not sparked by desire. Does she break her wudu? It's only you that's like, you know, but not her. You're the only one that's getting aroused. The other one doesn't. Good. This is actually the madhab. I remember a sheikh that was teaching us, you know, Hanbali uh, madhab. He's like, how is this even possible? I'm looking at a sheikh. <laughs> huh? And he was like, this is from the strange things in the madhab. And I was like, no, no, sheikh is not. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Say, what if one touches another man with shahwa? With lust? Is this happening at this moment in time? With a shadow of a doubt? I think I should add that to the thesis, right? It needs to be researched. I don't have an answer for it, honestly. طيب. Number five. كالأكل للحم إبل وزوال العقل Number five, brothers and sisters, is I'm just going to speed up a little bit because I have to go through the whole chapter of Ghusl as well and a bit of the Salah and then leave the rest till tomorrow. Eating camel meat. Eating camel meat. Right? As the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, Atawadda'u min luhu min ghanam? What about if I eat sheep? He said, if you want. 
And then when he was asked about the camel meat, he said, you must. Whether it is raw or cooked, it doesn't matter. Whether it's raw or cooked, it doesn't matter. That meat that you eat will break your... Although, number six. وَزَوَالُ الْعَقْلِ وَزَوَالُ الْعَقْلِ Losing your sanity. Is that which would break your wudu? Is that which would break your wudu? What's the evidence for that? Who can give me an evidence that if you were to now lose your sanity, you would break your wudu? Don't come to salat intoxicated. But does it show that he actually breaks? You're being told not to come. But we're talking about someone now who's going to lose his wudu. Huh? Why isn't that just a condition for you to make the wudu? But this one now, and it's not just losing your sanity, but also passing out or becoming completely drunk. Huh? But that's sleep though, right? I'll tell you guys, I'll tell you what they say. They say if you have to make wudu for sleeping and you're someone who would respond to a stimuli, somebody tried to wake up, you wake up straight away. Sah? And what about a situation where one has lost his consciousness more than the sleep? It's a bit of a aqli, logical type of evidence that they bring. That, did everybody get that? When it comes to wudu, sorry, when it comes to your sleep, you lose it. Even though you respond. So, you know, losing your consciousness a little bit here. Let's just say here you lost your consciousness, what? 20%. But when it comes to you being drunk, you've lost 40. Huh? And you have other situations which are worse. All right? We're talking about somebody who's come, become completely intoxicated. Huh? Not somebody who's tipsy, as we mentioned earlier. This guy's drunk out. He's rolling around at the bus stop. Huh? Number seven, وَغَسْلِ مَيِّتٍ Washing the deceased. We're talking about the one who comes in direct contact with his dead person. Does that make sense? Not the guy who's passing the shampoo or he's passing the different substances that is used or the sponge. Because you have a number of people around the deceased. Does that make sense? We're talking about the one who comes in direct contact with Washing the deceased. Right, the evidence for this is some of the statements of the companion, like Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala, and he said, Aqallu ma fihi al wudu. The least that one has to come with when washing the deceased is he has to make wudu. Does that make sense? Tell you, what about having a shower? Is that something that, what you guys think? Should he have a bath? There's a narration that states, Man ghastala mayyitan fali akhtasil. Whoever washes the deceased, he has to make ghusl. Huh? What do you think of the narration? Is this a situation here where we disregard the madhab and take the hadith? The hadith is actually weak. However, let me teach you guys a principle, right? That can come in extremely handy and perhaps you will appreciate that which the scholars of fiqh mention in their books. What did I just mention about the grading of this hadith? Weak. Ibn Muflih, rahmatullahi alayhi, mentions the following. If we have a weak hadith, which has a commandment, we don't just disregard the hadith in totality. We say it comes down from being mandatory to recommended. Likewise, if we have a weak hadith which has a prohibition, right? We don't just disregard it in totality. It comes down from being what? Haram to makruh. This is why in the book sometimes you will find something is makruh. You look for the evidence, you can't find it. And it may well be because of this. Huh? Like for example, after finishing huh? After urinating, right? To tap 
a private pot like that. Ensuring that there's nothing remaining. In the books you will find that this is recommended. Even though when you look at the narration, he says, إِذَا بَالَ حَدُكُمْ فَلْيَنْتُرْ ذَكْرُوا ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتِ After finishing your urine, make sure that you do that three times. This is a command. The hadith is weak. But in the books they mention it's recommended, so it came down from being what? Mandatory too. Does that make sense? It's just a handy thing to have. I thought I'd mention it as a side benefit. Number eight, وَمُوجِبَاتِ غُسْلٍ Anything that makes ghusl wajib also breaks your wudu. Take a moment out to maybe reflect on that. Anything that makes ghusl wajib upon you breaks your wudu. We'll come on to that which makes the ghusl wajib. For example, now one had a wet dream. Has he lost his wudu? Yes, he has. Yeah? That's number eight. And then the last thing that he mentions is وَلَا تَسْأَلْ سِوَى الثِّقَاتِ Do not ask except those who are trustworthy. Do not ask except those that are trustworthy. When it comes to knowledge, I'll mention a quick benefit. A man who killed 99. A barbaric, bloodthirsty human being who took all of these lives. However, he was smart enough to realize, right, if I need some information pertaining to my religion, who should I go to? He looked for the one who is most knowledgeable. When he was directed to a monk who was ignorant, he asked him, is there a way for me to be uh, forgiven? He said, no. 100. A 100th life that he took. Lack of knowledge could either get you killed or you could be the reason why people are killed. I have a lecture, it's called 20 Benefits Taken from the Hadith of the One Who Killed 100. You guys get a moment, inshallah ta'ala, watch it. It's like a practical way of how to derive benefits from a hadith. I stood over the hadith and for months I've been trying to what? Deduce benefits and as time went on, huh? I just what? From time to time we take a benefit out of it. When I first gave the lecture in Green Lane, I only took what? Five, six benefits. And then when I gave it in Australia, I reached 20 benefits on it. And it revolves around Right? Taking knowledge from the right people. You wouldn't go to a doctor to seek religious advice and vice versa. You don't do that as well. I remember when our brother was on the ventilator. Should we take him off? Should we not? This was a discussion amongst the family. If you ask Sheikh Saleh Al-Fawzan, he'll tell you, go and ask two trustworthy doctors. He will say to you, go to the people of expertise. As Allah says, first, Abi Khabira. Ask the people of expertise. So this was just a way to finish the line of poetry in order to make it rhyme. Now, You can see it rhymes. And then he says, وَيَمْنَعُ الْمُحْدِثُ مَسَّ الْمُصْحَفِ وَمِنْ طَوَافٍ وَصَلَاةٍ فَعْرِفِ He says, that which one who is in the state of impurity, now I'll rephrase that. He says, the one who is spiritually impure, cannot do the following things. Number one, touching the mushaf. Touching the mushaf. According to the arba'atu madahib. According to the arba'atu madahib. It's not just specific to the madhab of Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi. The Hanabila, huh? The Malikiyya, the Hanafiyya, and also the Shafi'iyya, they all take the view that you cannot touch the Mus'haf unless you're in the state of wudu. And they have a number of evidences. One of them is a statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla, لَا إِلَّا مطهرون. No one should touch it unless he is what? In a state of purity. Also, there is a hadith, a narration. فِي الْكِتَابِ الَّذِي كَتَبَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لِعَمْرِ بْنَ حَزْمٍ أَنْ لَا يَمَسَّ الْقُرْآنَ إِلَّا طَاهِرٍ There's a book that one time the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent to Amr ibn Hazm that had a whole load of instructions in there. And one of the instructions in there was that one should not touch the Mus'haf unless he's in a state of Tahara. Does that make sense? There's a lot of kalam pertaining to this narration. Right? Ibn Abdul Bari says, أَغْنَتْ شُهْرَتُهُ 
عن معرفة إسناده. This book is so well known, it's so well known. This book that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent to Amr ibn Hazm, that we don't even need to check the chain of narration because of how known it is. Right. This is of course alongside all of the other evidences that I mentioned. Also, you have brothers and sisters, the statements of the companions. Salman al-Farisi, Abdullah ibn Umar, Sa'd ibn Miwaqas, even his son one time mentioned, Kuntu umsiku al-mushaf li Sa'd. I used to hold the mushaf for Sa'd. And it's Sa'd ibn Miwaqas. Right? And as I was walking with him one time, فحتكت, I scratched myself. So his father said to him, لَعَلَّكَ مَسِسْتَ ذَكَرَكَ so perhaps you touch your private part. He said, Naam, yes I did, Father. He said, Qum fatawadda. Stand and go and make wudu. So you have a number of companions who took this view and no one opposed them on this. From the companions, Hanabil they said, Wala yu'rafu lahum mukhalif. This is like an ijma' a unanimous agreement. Right? This is when you're making direct tone. You want to touch the mushaf, use gloves. Or use your phone. This is not a mushaf. Does that make sense? Use the phone to read it. And then he says, وَمِن طَوَافٍ likewise tawaf. Whether it's an obligatory tawaf or a supererogatory tawaf, you have to what? Have wudu. That's the position of the majority of the scholars except the Hanafiya and also Shaykh Al-Sam Taymiyyah and Ibn Uthaymin. They all took the view that you don't have to have wudu when making tawaf. And my heart leans towards that. But we are studying the madhab, which says you have to have wudu. And it is a safer position as well. Right? I remember one time I was doing tawaf. I remember that I didn't make wudu after completing and it was so busy as well. Wallahi, I was absolutely exhausted. Right? And I know, you know, the strength on each side. I called Sheikh Asim al Qaryuti. I was like, Sheikh, huh? This is the position, and I'm very inclined towards the position of Sheikh Hussein Taymiyyah that you don't need to have. Although, what do you think, Sheikh? He was like, go make wudu and do it again. Right? And this is a safer view, which is, um, and sometimes, especially as brothers who study, we should take the safer view. Huh? Tayyip. Number three, وَصَلَاتٍ فَعْرِفِي And by the way, those who want the evidence, the statement of Abdullah ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنهما, when he said the salah is like the tawaf, إِلَّا أَنَّهُ أُبِيحَ لَكُمُ الْمَنْطِقِ Except that speaking has been made permissible for you when doing tawaf. Also, the Messenger of Allah said to Aish, إِفْعَلِ مَا يَفْعَلُ الْحَاجِ غَيْرَ إِلَا تَطُوبِ بَيْتِ حَتَى تَطْهُرِي Do everything that the haji does except the tawaf until you become pure. And of course, number three is the salah. Right? Number three is the salah. And likewise, brothers and sisters, if there is a sujood at tilawa, Shaykh Zakaria, is it everywhere or just here? And the TV got tired, but you guys are still, mashallah. Huh? You guys are still. We've only got a little bit left, brothers. Inshallah ta'ala, and then we will call it a day. Salah, you have to have wudu, which is, of course, known in the religion by necessity. Then you may have sujood at tilawa, a prostration of reciting, a prostration of thanks. They also say that this would fall under it as well. You must have wudu when doing such prostration. طيب فصل وفرد الغسل عن إنزاله ملد فصل وفرد الغسل عن إنزاله ملذة للمن وانتقاله حيض النفاس وكذا الإسلام والوطء والموت وقل حرام مكث الذي يلزمه في المسجد كذا تلاوة كتاب الصمد وفرده تعميم جسمه بما now he moves on to a different chapter, brothers and sisters. The chapter of Al-Ghusl. 
الغسل ما بعد ما هو استعمال ماء طهور في جميع البدن على وجه مخصوص. It is to use a type of water that is طهور on your whole body in a specific way. Does that make sense? That's what الغسل is. The first thing that makes the غسل واجب is number one إنزاله بلذة المنهي. Many coming out accompanied with a ladha that is accompanied with an enjoyment. Oh, there's another term for it you guys have? Pleasure. Right? And the many of a man and the many of a woman is ma'roof. As the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, Inna ما الرجل غليظ أبيض وماء المرأة رقيق أصفر. This fluid or this discharge that comes out of a man's front private part is a thick white discharge that comes gushing out. This is what many is, which is different to al-madhi. Which I'll come on to inshallah ta'ala. In a moment. Does that make sense? It is a thick type of liquid or fluid that comes pouring or rushing out. This is what al-mani is, which is accompanied with pleasure. Does that make sense? This is why he specifically mentioned biladha. It comes out with pleasure. Some people, brothers and sisters, they have a type of sickness where the many just keeps on coming out. Does the ghusl now become wajib upon him? Or what becomes wajib upon him? Wudu, because someone came out, right? Does that make sense? So anything that comes out makes the wudu wajib. But in order for the ghusl to become wajib, it has to be accompanied with pleasure. Now, as for the many of a woman, it is raqiq and asfar. As the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Right, is a light type of fluid that is yellowish. طيب. So that's the first one. Sexual intercourse. Right? Sexual. No, no, no. This is not a, a sexual. We're going to come on. The first one is one releasing. Many. One releasing spell. Does that make sense? Whether he uses a haram means, right? Whether it is him having a wet dream. Did many come out? Naami did. We know that using your hand is something that is haram. It is something that is haram. Allah Azza wa Jalla said when praising the believers, "Waladinahum lifurujim hafidun." Those who save God their private parts, illa ala azwajim o ma malakat imanhum. Except when it comes to their wives and also that which their right hand possesses. He didn't say uh, that you could start using your hands. In fact, you were instructed and commanded to fast. Whoever has the ability to get married, then let him do so. And whoever is not, then let him fast. Was one of the solutions to masturbate? It wasn't. It is something that is haram and it has a lot of medical side effects. Go look it up. It has a lot of medical side effects. You reach a point where you can't do anything. Huh? You can't do anything. You can't fulfill her desires. Right? You can't fulfill the desires of a woman. Right? And that is because you got used to being somebody who I think you guys understand what I'm talking about. Does that make sense? You become very weak in simple terms because of you constantly using your hand. And then it could even possibly lead to divorce because the woman, right, also is relieved. صح? You have to fulfill her desires and she takes longer to climax than the man. طيب. Brothers, two minutes. Stand up. If you need to do star jumps, then do so. Right? And we're going to commence inshallah ta'ala because an hour has gone by. Please brother, stand up.
let the blood start circulating and then we're going to inshallah ta'ala finish it and come back tomorrow طيب. brothers and sisters we talked about the semen coming out of one's front private part accompanied with pleasure طيب, one has a wet dream and he can't always remember having pleasure does he have to do ghusl? But he didn't feel anything, he missed out. Huh? Marakum. Safe option. Do you guys remember the hadith that I mentioned earlier about Umm Sulaim? When she said, Ya Rasulullah is not shy of the truth. Does a woman need to take a purificatory bath if she has a wet dream? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? Naam, when she sees? Huh? When she finds that her place is wet. So whether it came out with pleasure or not, you wake up or you remember having sexual intercourse or not in your dream or not. Huh? Doesn't make a difference. The fact that it's wet, it's enough. And this is again a principle that you study in Qawaid al Fukhiya. Who can give me the line of poetry? Al Hukmu Yadur Ma'ilati Wujudan Wadama. وكل حكم دائر مع علته وهي التي قد أوجب لشرعته. As a principle that you learn in Surah Fiqh, right? Likewise in Qawaid al-Fiqhiyya. As long as the reasoning is present, the ruling applies. Reasoning is no longer present, ruling doesn't apply. Right? A bit like intoxications. There's a particular drink that has intoxicants. What if the intoxicant is now removed? Is it still haram? Because the reasoning has been removed, which is the intoxication here. Likewise, brothers and sisters, when it comes to here, the Messiah said, as long as you see what? That a place is wet. Even if you remember yourself seeing something or whatever. Now you woke up and there's nothing there. Do you have to make also? No, you don't. Because the reasoning is not there. Hmm. طيب. Number two, when تقاله وانتقاله, which basically means the sperm moving away from its original place without it coming out. Everybody knows what I'm speaking about, right? One becomes sexually aroused and he releases, but it doesn't come out. Some people actually hold it in, which is not a smart thing to be doing. And it has some medical side effects. Right? It's holding it in. <laughs> does he have to do ghusl? Yes, he does. He can wait for it to come out. Right? But the fact that he moved, he can't pray. As soon as it moved. Because you see it moving down from his loins and his back. And then it takes a particular path and then it comes out. The fact... Huh, brother, you're right, yeah? <laughs> it's like he's dying in laughter, huh? You're right, yeah? Does that make sense, brothers? Huh? I, I make fiqh funny, don't worry. <laughs> no. The fact that he moved, ghusl has become wajib, and he can't pray you, at that, you know, after that has happened. So if he has ghusl, and then after having finished his ghusl, the semen comes out. Does he have to do ghusl again? It doesn't. Al-ma'u min al-ma'. Al-ma'u min al-ma'. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? It doesn't have to. But what he does have to do is what? Although, because you only do ghusl once. You only do ghusl once, you don't have to do it twice. And again, it's one of those things that Imam Ahmad's madhab is independent on. And there's a difference of opinion. And perhaps other than that is a strong view. The fact that all these brothers laughed it shows that it's a bit of a weird position to have. طيب. Number three, hayd. Menses. When a woman now comes off her monthly period, ghusl becomes wajib. Ghusl becomes wajib. Does that make sense? Again, it's one of those things that makes the ghusl wajib. Number four, Nifasin. Nifas. Postnatal bleeding. Again, it makes the ghusl wajib. Number five, al-Islam. 
When one becomes Muslim according to the Hanabila, he has to make what? He has to make ghusl. And the evidence for them is Qisad Thumamat ibn Uthalim. فَأَمَرَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَنْ يَغْتَسِلْ After he became Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed him, commanded him now to to ghusl. Does that make sense? It's a difference of opinion, right? But kind of like be easy with the guy who just became Muslim. Huh? Take it easy with him. Many of the other scholars, they say he doesn't have to, and that is because there were times when so many companions became Muslim, but no one instructed them to do the ghusl. And because of that, they said it's sunnah, not wajib. But the position here in the madhab is that it is wajib, it is mandatory to make ghusl. Hmm? However, they exempt two scenarios. Number one, somebody who died in a ma'raka, in a battle, you know, jihad is taking place, do you need to wash the deceased here? لا. You just bury him straight away. Sorry, I'm going into a completely different mas'ala. Forget about it. I think the tiredness is getting to me. That's a different issue. Al-Islam. So the fifth point is what? Al-Islam. Number four is postnatal bleeding. Number five is becoming Muslim. Number six, well, what? Penetration. One penetrating another. One penetrating another. If a man penetrates a woman, as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِذَا الْأَرْبَعَ ثُمَّ جَهَدَهَا فَقَدْ وَجَبَ عَلَيْهِ الْغُسْلِ Right? وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ وَإِنْ لَمْ يُنْزِلْ If one sits in between and then he penetrates her, right? غُسْل has become wajib even if he doesn't ejaculate. Does that make sense? Even if he doesn't ejaculate. And the ajib thing, brothers and sisters, is many people are unaware of this hukum. I've had people come up to me 30 years, I'm having sexual intercourse with my wife, and I didn't know, right, that I would have to take a ghusl if I don't ejaculate. And brothers and sisters, I must make mention of this as well, because we are living in a very filthy society. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the woman halal for you. The asal is that you could have sexual intercourse with you, you could have sexual intercourse with her, right? In, a, in whatever way you want. Nisa'akum harthun lakum fa'tu harthakum anashitu. Unless proven otherwise, or unless stated otherwise. The asal is you want to tilt her, you want to do this, it's perfectly fine. This is Allah Azza wa Jal saying this. However you want. However, as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, مَلْعُونٌ مَنْ أَتَمْ رَأَةً فِي دُبُرِهَا Curse is the one who has sexual intercourse with a woman from the back. This is something that is haram. It is from the major sins. Here you are being cursed. And any act that has the curse of Allah Azza wa Jal upon something, and it's considered a major sin. Also, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said another narration, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُوا إِلَىٰ رَجُلٍ أَتَىٰ رَجُلًا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ فِي دُبْرِهَا Allah Azza wa Jalla will not look at a man who had sexual intercourse with another man or a woman from the back. And this is another thing that we need to make mention of. The fact now that he has penetrated a man, does the ghusl become wajib? Also does become wajib. al what? Regardless of it being permissible or not, or something that is, whether it is a halal type of penetration or a haram type of penetration, ghusl becomes wajib. Another thing that I must mention, and excuse me for saying it, and I know Sheikh Abdul Wahid probably recently went through it in Aqsal Muqtasarat, and he can testify to this being inside of the kitab. Ibn Balban rahmatullahi alayhi and other scholars. In their books of fiqh, they speak about one penetrating an animal. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, we may think that this is not common. There are some abhorrent, filthy, despicable people out there who do that. I remember when we were youngsters growing up, this is back when, what? I was in Holloway school. 
2004, 2005. Every now and again, there would be some rumors going around about this particular thing. And one time, it, there was a discussion amongst the students, and it was on the news where a woman, she had sexual intercourse with a horse, and she ended up dying after that. This is then. And the Messenger told us, There doesn't come a time except the time that comes after is worse. I think they call this bestiality, right? Did I say right? Mm. As despicable it might be, it has to be made mention of. If someone had done that for whatever reason, but he still prays, there are people like that. There are people who are homosexuals, but they pray. And then he's messaging me saying, Akhi, wallahi, my iman went low and the shaitan got the better of me. Can I still pray? Am I still a Muslim? And there are those who do filth and evil with minors. And as I told you guys before, again, it's pretty common as well. Now he wants to pray. Is it mandatory upon him to do ghusl? La shakka wa Also in the books they mention having sexual intercourse with a dead person. Again, as despicable as it sounds. Is it something that happens? Yes, it does. I've read news articles. And again, as I told you guys before, the antenna goes to fiqh. He kills her. And then he what? Ends up having sexual intercourse with her. It's something that happens. It's not far-fetched. Right? Sheikh, did you want to add anything to that? <laughs> <laughs> Sheikh said you have to put over 18 on the video. طيب. Number seven, well, motu. If somebody dies, if somebody dies, of course, he doesn't have to take a bath, but he has to be washed. This is now number seven. This is now number seven. And then he says, وَقُلْ حَرَامُ Say it is haram for one to do the following things. Number one, to remain in the masjid. This masala comes in extremely handy when one is doing i'tikaf in the house of Allah. You had a wet dream. You're in the state of sexual impurity. Hadathun Akbar, right? Major spiritual impurity. Right? Is he allowed to remain in the house of Allah? Is he allowed to sit there in the prayer hall? Providing one condition is met, and that is. He goes and makes wudu. Only then he can come back and remain in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As narrated by Sa'id al Mansur in his Sunan, he said, Ata ibn Yasar, rahimahullah ta'ala, was from the Fuqaha al Saba'a. Right? Ra'aytu ashab al Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yajlisuna fil mizdidi wa hum mujnibun. I would see the companions sitting in the house of Allah azza wa jal while they were in a state of sexual impurity. إِذَا تَوَضَّعُوا وُضُوءَ الصَّلَةِ And that is only after they would make the wudu that they would normally do for the salah. You have to get out of the prayer hall, make wudu and then come out, you can sit there. Does that make sense? Mm. طيب, I know I'll probably get a hundred questions from the sisters. What about the woman who's on a message? Can she stay in the house of Allah? Azawajal? Right? According to the four madhahib, she can't. According to the form of that, she can't. She's not allowed to sit in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it is for a, for a lesson. Yes, even if it is for a lesson. Right? Some scholars, they mention if she's like a Quran teacher and she's getting paid, in that case, we can maybe what? Exempt her, providing that she huh, ensures that nothing leaks out by wrapping herself up properly. But generally speaking, it's a no-go. And of course, the easier answer to give is that she can, but when the four Malahi brothers and sisters take a view, it's not a light matter. Don't ever look at it as they are just men. The fact that all the four Malahi they take a position, humble yourself. Right? It's not a light matter. The fact that all of them are on one side and then you, Mr. Muhammad from the 21st century comes along and wants to push his own view, I'm not saying that you can't, but don't just dismiss it like that. Right? And one of the evidence that a woman, when she's on her message, she can't go into the house of Allah Azza wa One time the Messenger said to Aisha, Nawilni al-Khumrah. 
bring me the praying mat. I think that's what they call it. Khumrah. Straight away. Her reaction was, Ana hayat. I'm on my menses. The fact that she reacted like that, what do you think you can take away from this, brothers? Or what can you understand from it? That the default understanding amongst the female companions was that if a woman's on a mensin, she shouldn't go into the masjid. Sah? The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said to her, Inna hayyataki laysat fi yadik. Your menses is not inside of your hand. Go and get it for me. Go and get it for me. So she reached out and she took it. Right? We have other evidences, brothers and sisters, where an individual can walk past a masjid, can walk through it. And also Aisha radiallahu ta'ala was an incident where she would walk through. If she saw a sick person, she would ask and then she would continue walking. And there's other hadith as Umm Atiyah, where the Messenger Allah wasalam, would instruct the women to go out for Eid, to the praying area, the musalla. But, وَيَعْتَزِلْنَ الْحُيَّضُ الْمُصَلَّى as for a woman on her menses, she would have to what? Sit apart from where the musalla area is. And there's other evidence as well. Hadith Abi Huraira, I believe it is. I don't make the masjid halal for someone who's in the state of Janaba and also what? A woman on her menses. So these are some evidences. I know there's a difference of opinion, but the former that we take this view, and it's not a light matter, and there's some strong evidences. It's better that you listen online. Insha'Allah ta'ala, naam. Number two, kada tilawatu kitab samadi This is also another controversial one, right? Reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you recite the Quran after you've entered in the state of Janaba? Again, you may think, why would somebody do that? Brothers and sisters, there are people. The Quran has become so moist on their tongues. From the time that they wake up, they start reading. Even sometimes in the bathroom, they would have to be told, listen, stop reading Quran. While he's showering, people sing, right? He's reading Quran. And that's because he's become so used to it. He's in a state of janab, he's allowed to read the Quran. لا. Hadith Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anu kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yuqri'un al-Quran ma lam yikun junuba. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to teach the Quran, providing that he was not in the state of janab, akhraju al-khamsa. Narrated by the four books of hadith, or by the four great imams, also Imam Ahmed. Yeah. Also, there's another narration where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made wudu and he said, Hakada liman laysa bi junub. Made wudu and then he started reading the Quran. And he says, This is how it should be when someone is not in the state of Janaba. However, Amma al junub wala ayah. You're in the state of Janaba, you can't even read an ayah. If you wanted to read half an ayah, it's fine. Because the hadith says ayah. Tayyib, question you're probably going to ask me, I'm in the state of Janaba. After having sexual intercourse, can I? It's just ayat al kursi. Because ayat al kursi is a whole ayah, even some of our mashayikh, they are still looking into the issue. But other awrad like inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, it is a dhikr, it is your adhkar al sabah wal masa, your morning and also your evening adhkar. And some wordings are synced within the Quran. Or Exactly what is mentioned in the Quran, like for example saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We say that a lot, right? When a calamity hits us. Can you say that? While well, in the state of Janaba, even though it's part of the Quran, labas, no problem. According to the Hanami, they have no issue with it. <sighs> we'll look into it, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyip, and then he says, Wa farduhu. تعميم جسمه بما وشرط والواجب كالوضوهما. He says that which is fard when it comes to washing yourself is the following. I know you guys are getting very tired, brothers and sisters. I remember one time our Sheikh Sulaiman Ruhayli was teaching us, and he seen that the students were getting tired. He closed it and began to give them a reminder. I'll give you guys that reminder as well. And he said, "العلم ثقيل. علم is very heavy." وَلَا يَصْبِرُ إِلَّا الْقَلِيلِ And those who are patient are just a few. وَلَا يَصِيرُ مِنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ إِلَّا أَقَلَّ الْقَلِيلِ And those who become scholars are only what? A minority within a minority. It's tiring. Brother Hussein, al-Iraqi, right, who is attending from Al-Bayt, 
Make sure when you see him, you show him some love, you know? It's from Al-Bayt, the Prophet's family. He goes, my, my wrist is about to, huh? my wrist is hurting. It's painful. However, when you look back at your notes five years down the line, you'll feel so good. These notes that I have on my phone, brothers, it was maybe, what, six years ago. My Apple iPhone. Huh? I'm a sincere, loyal Apple fan, brothers. Huh? The notes has made my life so easy. Wallahi. For a very long time, I used to make dua for Steve Jobs up until recently. <laughs> huh? That Allah guides him to Islam. And then somebody told me that he passed away in 2011. <laughs> huh? Fashahid, you know, the notes come in extremely handy later on. Wallahi. It's a sweetness that cannot be put into words. Um, you're going to have kids, somebody needs to teach them. Hmm? So now that which relates to uh, what needs to be washed. You have two types of ghusl, brothers and sisters. The first type of ghusl is al ghusl al The type of ghusl that covers the bare minimum. The type of ghusl that covers the bare minimum. Nearly done, guys. Yeah? A type of ghusl that covers the bare minimum. And that is washing every part of your body. The water has to what? Reach every part of the body. And I explained before what al ghasl means. What does ghasl mean? To wash. The water has to flow on that part of the body. Does that make sense? It's not masih. Masih is imrar al-yad al al udu To pass wet hands on that part of the body. You have to make sure that the water reaches every part. And if you're somebody who's heavy, you have to make sure that the water reaches under your... Yeah? You have to make sure you lift it. I'm going to come on to that. Huh? Likewise, sisters, they have to make sure that they wash under their chests. Sometimes forget, forgotten. Also that which is forgotten is one's armpits when taking a shower. See that the water... Is it dropping, dropping, dropping? Does that make sense? So you have to make sure that you wash your whole body. Right? And according to the Hanabil, you have to also what do madmada and istinsha. This is the bare minimum. Then you have a type of ghusl that is more complete. Al ghusl kamil. And this is now fulfilling the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا اغتسل من الجنابة يبدأ فيغسل يديه ثم يفرغ بيمينه على شماله فيغسل فرجه ثم يتوضأ في... ثم يأخذ الماء فيدخل أصابعه في وصول الشعر ثم حفن على رأسه ثلاث حفنات ثم أفاض على سائر جسده. صلى الله حديث. right he would first start you know washing his hands ثم يفرغ بيمينه على شماله he would take water pour it on his left hand and then he would wash use his left hand to wash his private part. ثُمَّ يَتَوَضَى Then he would make wudu. ثُمَّ يَأْخُذُنَا He would take water and then he would put it in the root of his hair. ثُمَّ حَفْنَا عَرَزِي ثَلَاثَ حَفْنَا Then he would what? Pour three handfuls onto his head and then he would wash the rest of his body. And there's other, you know, additions to it as well, inshaAllah ta'ala. But you have the sunnah way and you have that which is going to cover the bare minimum. You're in a rush, you're late for work, you're in a state of janaba. You rush, just quickly have a shower, make sure everything went, and then you walk out. But at times, brothers implement the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is what he mentions here. And he says that the conditions and also that which is wajib is similar to the wudu. Whatever was the condition or wajib over there also applies here. Like the tasmiyah, saying bismillah. We mention the wudu right here as well. Likewise, before he starts, he says bismillah. And we will stop there, insha'Allah ta'ala.